Okay. Okay, and let's go ahead and let everybody in. Admit all. And. Welcome everybody. Good morning. Good morning. We're giving everyone a minute to join. Oh, looks like we will not be streaming this live because there's a link, broken link. So that's okay. It will be available. We're recording this session today. It will be available on my YouTube channel by tomorrow. We still have a few more folks joining. One second. A few more folks signing in here. So we'll give everyone a minute. If I could just uh, pipe in here. Hi, my name is Tessa Sims. I'm with Agent Real Estate Schools, supporting Allie and Mike for today. Um, this is a great time to make sure your videos are on. Yes, yeah, it get is. Those, get those videos on. Make sure you're dressed, wearing shirts. <laughs> Please make sure you're wearing shirts. <laughs> yeah, it's sad that, that, and if you stand up, make sure you're wearing pants too, please. <laughs> <laughs> Not that that's ever happened before, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to say no comment to that one. <laughs> Welcome, welcome everybody to Marketing it's, Monday. It's hot in San Diego, Mike. It's a hot San Diego. It is definitely hot. So I'm making sure that, that all this works here. But yeah, no, it's hot. I was just outside. So um, not as hot as it was over the weekend. We still have a lot of folks joining. So we're going to give everyone a couple minutes. We're we're gonna we're definitely going to hit the, uh, the limit there, Allie. Yes, we are. We're going to have to increase this for next time. There we go. Oh, it looks lovely. Oh, good stuff today. It's up there, right? Because okay. I was, I was, this, this thing was giving me giving me a hard time. It, it's been one of those. So I'm just like, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to uh, kick this off. Um, so I'm Allie Jackson with Centennial Escrow. Thank you, everybody, for joining this special edition of Marketing Monday, because you can't do a whole lot of marketing if you can't get your contracts updated and signed, right? So uh, today we have a very special guest speaker, Mike Shankman. Uh, Mike is a broker associate with Coldwell Banker, a 20, 25 year veteran in the real estate industry, former realtor of the year, a recent past realtor of the year with SDAR. He is a, a professor in real estate with UCSD. Uh, in fact, we could take up a good hour of our two hour training today if I continued down the path of talking about all Mike's incredible credentials. Uh, but first, I just want to say thank you, Mike, for joining us and say hey. Hey, thanks for letting me. I mean, uh, you gave me something else to do. So that's, that's pretty good. I, I was a little bored. Today. <laughs> hey, if I can do anything, I had, Allie knows this. I had COVID last week. It was my first time having COVID ever. I thought I was like immune from it. And that's the one thing that'll that'll put you down. So I was doing everything on Zoom again. I realized how uncomfortable it was to wear a mask. I had to wear a mask again last week. It's kind of scary. So I finally tested negative. But yeah, thank you for for letting me do this. I, I know a lot of people who are on this. I'm really happy because this is the one thing we need to do. So we need to know this. Yeah, it's uh, it's very timely. And I can't thank you enough for joining us and providing this training. Um, and we will have this available on my YouTube channel on uh, by tomorrow or sooner. Uh, so if you want to come back and watch certain parts of it, if you want to share it with other associates, um, we did overbook this training because uh, we usually don't have 100% show ups on a webinar. But we are just about at capacity now. So um, I'm really glad that we're recording this one. I also want to give a shout out to my partner in crime over here, Tessa Sims. Uh, Tessa is with Agent Real Estate Schools. Say hey, Tessa. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Tessa I'll be monitoring the chat session. So if you have questions, you um, just uh, drop that in the chat bubble. I'll be able to address those the best that I can. Ali, I'm letting everybody in. Looks like um, we're getting real close. Uh, if you guys have a question, because we've got such a large, uh, large audience, please rate, use the emotions and raise your hand or just raise the hand so that we can call on you. Um, if you've got a question, trust me, I'm monitoring those. I'll roll those up to Mike. Um, if you don't have your video on, 
please make sure that your name is renamed so we know who you are. Okay. Thank you so much. And, and, and I will so you all know, I mean, at this point after uh, COVID, et cetera, but maybe some of you have forgotten because it's been a, a little little while. You might have gotten rusty on Zoom, but um, in the bottom center of your screen, um, you can go in there into the chat. There's a little ellipses, three dots. So you can click that and enter your questions in there. I do ask to, if you look over to the left, um, you'll see a little uh, microphone. You'll see a little video camera icon. Um, we'd love to see your beautiful face. So if you are... Um, camera ready, uh, go ahead and put the video on. And uh, please, for audio, hit the mute button. If we uh, want to interact a little bit, you can unmute just for that conversation. But uh, we are asking that you go ahead and mute that because there's a lot of folks on here today. Um, again, I am recording this session. So uh, I will send out a link to all attendees with the link to checking it out on the YouTube channel. It will stay up there on the Marketing Monday YouTube channel. Uh, so without further ado, I'm just seeing if we have a few more folks joining us here. Uh, we do want to get going because Mike has a huge agenda to cover. But again, I just want to thank all of you. And by the way, got to do a little advertisement here and shout out. If we can help you with your escrow needs, we certainly would love to. I have uh, the best escrow officers in all of San Diego County. So uh, they're at your ready. And uh, we make sure that we get you closed and we get you closed on time. Um, and then I'm here as your marketing resource as well. So I've got, I've got a team to get you closed and I'm here to help you get your next one. So with that, I'm going to allow this on over to Mike Shankman and have you take it away. Is it my turn? Can I talk? Awesome. Yes. No, I, I was just, I was just like, I'm waiting for my dogs to start barking. And I figured the only way to make them bark was to unmute. Let's all remember uh, Zoom etiquette <laughs> is always fun on these things. So if your microphone is on, I reserve the right to, I had it happen the other day. Someone like left their microphone on and all of a sudden started taking a call saying, hi, Chad. And I made the group all say, hi, Chad on Zoom. <laughs> so we, we try to, you know, we, we try to be a fun group in here. I mean, look, why are we in real estate? We're in real estate because it's supposed to be, at least some of us, it's supposed to be a fun, independent sort of, you know, we work and we we run our business. And of course, you know, I, obviously I've heard a lot of things from a lot of people. I've heard statistics that have come out. I've had to stay off social media for a while because it got kind of, kind of sad to like get to and see how people were kind of reacting to all these changes. And I'll be honest, like, you know, the more and more I go over it, and I have literally spent months going over this. I've gone over it with people like Karen Van Ness at SDAR. I've gone over this with Tessa. I have gone over this with, with various members of like PSAR and all different associations, people on forums committees with CAR, I've watched the changes and then the changes of the changes. The more I work on it, the more it makes sense. And that's what I'm hoping. What I want to say is like, look, one, don't be afraid. Two, just understand what you know and don't be afraid to ask for what you don't know. And three, please get the hell off TikTok or Instagram Reels because it does not give proper information. And I say that because I have been on there and I've had stuff sent to me and it's very incorrect. I mean, I'm seeing signs that say offering 2.5% commission broker compensation on social media. I think everyone saw that one. It was all over Facebook and everything. Look, there is a couple of sources, which I'll give you at the end. You'll have my information if you want to reach out to me directly. You know, the only way, and people have asked, why are we doing this? Because our community needs to work together. We need to understand what's going on, what we can do, what we can't do. And honestly, the whole reason we're in this mess is because the consumer doesn't appreciate who we are and know who we are. And I'll get to that in just a second. But I think, honestly, this can be something where we pivot and adapt accordingly, as long as we we lean on each other and understand what we know and don't know. And uh, honestly, the the time for the, the complaining about it is over. I'll do enough of it in here. Trust me. I'll, I'll mention things where, like, to be blunt, not to offend anyone, I'll, I'll do the bitching just like everybody else will on this. Um, but I'll do it for you, okay, so that we're good. Um, but this is happening. So what we need to do is adapt to it and move forward. So I know some of you have probably taken classes already on this. I can guarantee you this is different because this is based on the final version that was released uh, released uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, so we're going to get into it here. Let me go ahead and get started. If it'll let me. Okay, I'm going to go over agency, the buyer representation forms, form connections. Uh, I'm going to do BRBC step by step buyer broker obligations, and then your mediation advisories and some other information. 
Um, I'm also going to try and interweave how you should go over some things. But one thing I want to point out, look, your broker should be someone or your office manager or your team lead should be someone that you are constantly in contact with. If you are one of these individuals, meaning the broker of record or designated officer of your organization, if you are the team lead, if you are a mentor or anything, look, you need to be in communication with your agents because this is where this comes into play is I'm going to give you what's in the form. And I'm going to tell you certain aspects that I think of work based on people I've spoken to and things that are good for our region, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of things are dictated by how your broker wants to do this. I also know that there are organizations like, say, Caldwell Banker and some others who have their own buyer representation. Look, talk to your broker about those ones. Um, I'm going over here what's with the CAR forms and which, honestly, I'm the one I'm following those. So we'll, we'll get into that. And that's what I... The questions, we'll try and group them. Like I know Tessa's going to be watching that. I'm all about people being able to turn your cameras on, turn your microphones on. Anyone who's taken a class with me in person, I love the interaction because I believe real estate's all about interaction. Um, but of course, today we want to make sure we keep everything on time. So, But I want to field your questions. I may say hold off on that, or maybe we'll do a lot of them at the end. So let's see what we can do here, okay? So I like to start with this. Why? Because I like to give you a little background. People always go, why? I always believe to fix a problem, you got to understand what the problem was. And clearly, you know, I have this quote, which was from a, a Harvard professor, uh, said in a competitive market, economics predicts that the price of a service should be related to the cost of providing that service, as well as to the value of the service to the consumer. I'm going to highlight something on this, though, which is right here. The value of providing buyer broker services has fallen. And I invite all of you to ask yourself, has the value of providing the buyer broker services fallen or has the way we relay that service fallen? And I always like to go back to a survey that was done at the end of 2023, I believe it was in November, that 75%, 75% of buyers did not know how their agent was paid. And I want to also go back, if you all remember, if, I don't know, ages of anybody here, but I, I've learned the hard way not to quote movies in some of my class that you see, but um, because I, I realized I've been in real estate longer than a lot of them have been alive. But the point is, if you remember the movie American Beauty and Annette Bening in the beginning, and she was saying, I'm going to sell a house today. And she's scrubbing and she's doing this stuff. She's blowing dirt off the fans. And, you know, she's like, I'm going to sell a house today. I'm going to sell this house today. And now fast forward to now, and we've got Christine Quinn on Selling Sunset, walking in her Louis Vuitton to her chauffeured car after her buyer has received the keys to the home that she represented them. Is it any wonder that we are inside of the mess we are in? It is time for us to start giving our value. And a lot of these forms do that. All it really does is open negotiation. So I guess really focus on that because that's what NAR did. I will go over certain aspects of, of the DOJ. I will also refer a lot of you uh, to a gentleman that I refer or that I, I respect greatly. And that's if you have any real questions on your MLS, I recommend all of you. I've said I'm going to try and make him Insta famous. Uh, Saul Klein, who's the uh, CEO of SDMLS, which a lot of you are members of. Um, I recommend you add his LinkedIn and add his Instagram and Facebook. That's S-A-U-L-K-L-E-I-N, I believe. Um, and actually, Tessa, if we can put it in the chat. This is probably one of the best resources for you to have to understand what these changes are in real time. Because he posts every day, especially now, about what the changes are and what that means, including opinions of what's been going on outside. So I think that's a great resource. Um, you know, a lot of this comes down to trust. What is trust? You know, we always assume that people have trust. I always hate assuming. Why? Because when you assume, what do you do? You make an ass of you and me. I hate assuming. So hands down, I can see Portia smiling here. She's right at my corner screen. Yeah, she's, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm looking. But we assume. And when I say this, people are like, no, I don't do that. How many of you have met a client at like the grocery store back, you know, when we went to grocery stores and didn't use Insta Instacart? Uh, and maybe like a day later, you talk to them and they found out you were a realtor or whatever from being in there. And then they tell you a day after that, you know, I decided to use my, my friend or my cousin as a realtor. And you're like, why? I'm the greatest ever. But they don't know you. And we haven't had a chance to establish that trust. You know, I always go back. There was uh, an individual um, who had said recently to me, we now have to relay and display that trust within an hour, something that we had other time to do. And I think that's very big because what is trust? It's a firm belief in reliability, truth, ability, or strength of something or someone. And that is we work in trust. Okay. By the way, do, do they, are they the only ones who have to trust us? No, we have to trust them too, because I don't get 
paid if I don't sell a home to them, right? If I don't work with them and get this thing completed or close on the transaction, or at least do what my contract says. So there's trust that goes both ways. And that's why I've always promoted using the buyer representation forms. In fact, I've, I've kind of been misunderstood as to why we didn't have to before now, but I will go over some of that. Before I get any further though, I do want to go over right here, our disclosure regarding our real estate agency relationship, which really is a big portion of our trust. And it says right up front, because it's part of civil code, uh, that we have to do this. As you'll notice, um, civil code 2079.13 says that we have to give this agency before we go into other forms. And when I meet with clients, the first thing I do is give them this buyer representation, which outlines and starts to establish the relationship of trust. It defines agency. The seller's agent, which owns a fiduciary duty. The buyer's agent, who again, owes a fiduciary duty. And then the dual agent, which guess what? Big surprise, owes another fiduciary duty to both seller and buyers. And it defines the seller and buyer responsibilities. I know a lot of us might remember back when we had that third agency and that went away years ago. But then when I go over it with them, and I'm doing it a little quicker here to keep us within our time frame. I go over these specific sections and I flip the form around if I'm in person. And yeah, I still do it in person. If I'm on Zoom, which I've done, I like to point these out. It says, look, to you as the seller, or if I'm talking to the buyer, I go to the seller. Their agent has a fiduciary duty of utmost care, integrity, honesty, and loyalty in dealing with the seller. Diligent exercise of reasonable skill and care. Uh, duty to be honest and fair and deal in what? Good faith. And then a duty to disclose all facts known to the agent materially affecting the value and desirability of the property that are not known to her within diligent attention and observation. And you'll notice on the seller's agent, if I look down, it's the exact same as it is for the buyer's agent because it doesn't change. You know, I get in the whole old car thing and all that, but here's the bottom line. As agents, we have a duty to act in good faith and we have a duty to be honest and true. Do we make decisions on these properties? No, we do not. We advise. That's the purpose of our license. And also in an agent representing both buyer and seller, again, utmost care, honesty, integrity in dealing with both seller and buyer. I bring this up because there is a section that's now in the RLA that talks about unrepresented. And we still have a duty to have be fiduci uh, fiduciaries to them. So, and I'll bring that up in a little bit. So just remember though, here at the bottom, and I've highlighted it, the law requires each agent with whom that you have more than a casual relationship, right? A casual relationship, I've always wondered what that is, to present this disclosure form. Now, of course, as we move forward, we're now gonna go into that buyer representation agreement. And you'll, you'll see that we have a lot of you know, thoughts of what that is. Well, here really is what it is. It's an agreement between a potential buyer of real property and a real estate broker. Remember, it can be exclusive or non-exclusive. And I love going over the exclusivity part of this. You know, people always go, well, I only do exclusive arrangements. I go, well, but you know, at the same time, there is a purpose for doing a non-exclusive. And let me ask you this. So if I were to see, you know, Tessa, you know, and, and say Tessa and I were on like a blind date and I met her or like, what are the kids doing now? They're swiping right and left. So I get to go, you know, swipe right and we've matched and I met her somewhere. And as soon as I walked in, I sat down and go, Tessa, it's going to be so much fun marrying you. She would flip out and run out of the room. So I want people to understand there is a time and a place for things. And these agreements simply establish your protection as agents. And now it's going to be required that you have it before you even show up for them. So what has, what does it really do? It defines the scope and the task of the duties to be formed by the buyer and broker, provides written consent to dual agency if that develops. And yes, we can still do dual agency. Okay. It places a limit on the time with, within which legal action can be brought and outlines the terms of that legal action. Anywhere in here, have I said anything about compensation? No. You know why? Because I'm outlining value. And right up front, that's the more important part of this. And by the way, because of that value, I get paid. So I'll show you how that all comes together. Here's terms of the new agreement. Now, there is no offer of compensation anywhere in the MLS. None, zero, zilch. And please stop trying to find workarounds to this. I saw an email that came out from Saul actually recently, and it's all in their breakdown. And it said that any violations of any meaning of this, I believe, is a $1,500 fine because it is not to be put in there, not to be put in comments, not to be put on signs, not to be put on Zillow. If you're publicly advertising the property, and the point being is we don't want you going to properties that pay more commission to show that only to your client. That was the crux of this, right? 
And I can get into more and more. I think we've all beaten it like a dead horse, but this is, I keep seeing people saying, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? We're going to show you how to do it. Um, agents working with buyers need to have a written agreement before giving the buyer an in-person or virtual tour of the property or a virtual tour. Okay. Anytime you're doing what's called broker involvement, you should have a written agreement. Uh, broker agreement must clearly disclose the amount of compensation. The broker agreement must clearly disclose that compensation is negotiable and agents cannot receive more money than is specified in the agreement. That's right. If you didn't know that or find that out already, whatever you put for your broker compensation in the agreement, say I have a broker compensation agreement that is saying uh, I get paid two and a half percent as an example. And I end up, uh, someone says, or someone says we'll pay through negotiation, they'll go, we'll give you 3% in compensation. Guess what? It's two and a half percent. So that is the maximum you can receive. Um, so we'll we'll delve into that. And you'll notice I took this language directly from CAR. Clearly disclose and clearly disclose. You'll see a lot of information comes down to what is it that the consumer wanted. And also there's protections for us as agents. Here's your buyer representation forms as we have it right now, okay? And you'll see everything from the buyer representation and broker compensation agreement to the notice of broker involved properties, to the BMI, to all sorts of things. I'm not gonna use all the acronyms because, you know, uh, you know, we'll get all confused on it, but here's the ones that are encompass seller and buyer from the buyer representation forms. Okay. Broker compensation advisory, the property showing and representation agreement, the PSRA, the seller payment to buyer broker and the cooperating compensation. Now on the most recent and final iteration, they eliminated, or I'm sorry, these are the new forms. Okay. These are the ones were added. The most recent iteration eliminated these two forms. There is no more ABCD, the anticipated broker compensation disclosure, and there is no more cooperating broker compensation agreement, CBC. There is nothing, nada, zero, that says anything about buyer compensation before you make the offer on the property, period, okay? We get into the listing agreement. And then the, remember, the whole purpose of this was to open up those doors. So the listing agreement is very important in understanding this, which is why I incorporated it in. It's not, I don't know how many of you are listing agents. And I'm looking on the side, I have the screens over here on the side. I don't know how many of you are listing agents. Probably all of you, right? If you weren't before, you are now. Um, but probably all of you. And here's the thing. If I'm a listing agent, I'm prepping my seller for the fact that they may receive an offer, not that they will, right? But they may receive an offer that includes for payment of the buyer broker compensation based on the agreement they have. So when I have my listing appointments, I'm starting to account for that. And I just did it the other day. Uh, working with the client, I go, he's all, I, I, and by the way, people are like, when do you bring up the settlement? I bring it up when I need them. They know about it. If they don't know about it, I don't know where the heck they've been. So I like to call out the elephant in the room and say, we do have a settlement. Here's what's been going on. Because more so, there's a lot of misinformation. And I like to get past that misinformation, okay? Um, as far as the listing agreement goes, I do prep them for it. And I've started to say, we have this, and now they'll be presenting offers that could include for you to have to pay or requesting you to pay the broker compensation for the, for the buyer. So that's how I start to work this in here because that's all we really have to do is start realizing how we incorporate it into our offers. But you'll notice this is the residential listing agreement as it was, um, as it is now, the final version. You'll notice it has the compensation to seller's broker, the additional compensation to the broker if it is unrepresented. And that's not dual agency. That's I, which they're expecting to have happen now more. That's Buyers go through Zillow and decide to present an offer themselves or Redfin or any, or any of these or any on, online site where they're not using an agent from there, but they're doing it themselves. The point being is that I'm going to be doing more work as a listing agent. Therefore, I should get a little more compensation from the seller in that respect. Now, there have been discussions of whether or not as a listing agent, I can give the car forms to that unrepresented buyer. I've had some uh, one attorney said, yes, you can. And then my argument was, I never do that because it's an infringement of the licensing that I paid for for those car agreements. Check with your broker. I'm still looking into this one. Uh, that question has come up. I do not know the answer to it. I haven't had time. So, but definitely check with your broker how to handle an unrepresented buyer. Okay. 
because I don't want anyone to get, get into trouble with that one. Um, continued right to compensation for broker identified prospective buyers and seller obligation to pay previous brokers. You'll notice what I want to point out isn't what's in here, but what's not in here. This is the red line version that wasn't the final. This is the one as of three weeks ago. And what I want to point out to you is everything that's not highlighted was removed. The optional additional compensation to, if any, to seller's broker to be offered to buyer broker, gone. The if same individual represents both buyer and seller, gone. And then they removed the thing that there was this very confusing line that talked about how to calculate the compensation and which area applied. So again, there is no more including any optional seller concessions because that's the one everyone's been talking about. That's gone now too. Because the whole point is if we can't put it in CBC, we'll put it in concession. Look, let the attorneys battle this out as they will. But as the forms are right now, this is how it's supposed to be. So that's how we're putting it together and that's how we're teaching it. Okay. So we get to the buyer representation and broker compensation agreement form BRBC page one. This is the previous one. And the red line shows all the changes. So that's the change. It's a completely new form. And I deliberately kept the red line so you all could see the changes. I'm not going to, I'll briefly go over a few of the things that haven't changed. But that's about it. Remember, it's a non-exclusive unless checked in initial. That's not new. That is, as of two years ago, an understanding that why are we why are we forcing people into this? Let's point out that the buyer representation agreement is a non-exclusive by default. You have to literally check to make it exclusive. But, and what we're essentially saying is, we're going to date a little bit. How long you date is up to you, okay? I'm not the one to tell you. If you want to put them into a marriage in day one, that is your choice. But you have the option to do it. And at minimum, you can say to someone, look, this is protecting the properties I show you. So we'll move down here a little bit because I'm going to show you a little bit more. Hold on, stall for a second. Non-exclusive on A2, unless you check the box. But now it's not just you check the box on the last page, the signature page at the very top, which is paragraph 15. I skipped ahead so you could see it. It actually has it where it reiterates it and makes the buyer initial it. So there is no question as to whether or not this is exclusive. And that's only for the exclusive representation. Notice it says if exclusive is checked in paragraph 2A2, then the initial the buyer must initial here or and initial here. And that's, of course, because we live in California. Welcome to California. But it's good to reiterate these things. So the other change, representation period is not to exceed three months. Whether exclusive or non-exclusive, you have to renew it every three months, which honestly, the way it was pitched to me by someone, it was actually uh, Ray Frazier from Keller Williams, who had said uh, in this thing that I sat in a little bit ago with him, and I know Ray from the board and all that, you know, he's great at, at pitching this and explaining it because, yeah, it's my cat, my daughter's cat, sorry. She likes to jump in in very inopportune situations and say hi to people. So uh, my daughter's cat, which means I have a cat. Uh, he said, look, if I'm talking to my client, so like, say I'm talking to Portia and I look over at Portia and she's my buyer and I'm like, here's the deal. Every three months you get to reevaluate. And that's really what it comes down to. And I say it in the beginning, I'm going to do this. It's a three month agreement. And at the end of three months, I'm going to ask you to renew it. And at that time, we're going to get to discuss what you like and don't like. And I actually kind of like that, believe it or not. It also kind of negates this whole thing of, you know, everyone's got an agent representing them and they're coming in and we don't know what's going on on it. Look, it keeps us in check. That's how I have to look at it because that's one of the new things that's here. And the bottom line is every three months, we're going to be renewing this. Now, that doesn't apply if it's a corporation, an LLC, or a partnership. So, and I will, I will leave that just to be in terms of that definition. I'm not going to interpret it for you. Um, but if I'm signing an agreement with a buyer as an individual, yes, it has a three month maximum that the agreement can be signed for unlimited renewals on that, but I just can't write the agreement past that. So I do want to point out, as we point out to our clients that the form is five pages and guess what? The buyer is advised to read all five pages. Why do they do that? Because a lot of people go through that first page and they stop. Well, the important part is for all five and also for the client to say, oh, I didn't read that. No, you have no choice. It's here at the top that you are advised to. Can't force you to do anything, but you need to be doing that. 
Uh, it is default to single family residential as we go down to the next section, which talks about property to be acquired. Single family residential, which includes condominiums and manufactured homes and condos includes townhomes and all that. Okay. Or if you check, you can exclude SFR from the agreement. You can check the box for a multifamily residential with two to four units or five more. Remember, over four is considered commercial, commercial res. Um, we go to industrial, vacant land, commercial, tenancy in common, or the following specified properties only. This is just a re revamping of how the original form was. As an example, remember, before I always thought every single agreement should have a buyer representation agreement. And you know, uh, the ones that we never did are the ones that are most likely to have or should have them because of the most likely for a lawsuit. I always call them the F words, the friends and family, the ones that are like the ones we always say, oh, that's no big deal. I don't need an agreement. And then that's also the one that you made the least amount of money and have the biggest headache on. So everybody gets in. I see all these people shaking their heads. Y'all been there. So, <laughs> so, but we got to do these, right? And so when you're doing this agreement, and for specified, as an example, I had a friend years ago up in Orange County. He's my best, I always say he's my best friend. You know, the one that would be sitting, the, the expression goes, your friend bails you out of jail, your best friend sitting next to you in the cell saying, what just happened? Tim was my best friend, right? And so uh, when I, what is, what is California law? I saw a question. I just want to make sure I'm very clear on what is California law from Lydia. She's, she asked about the three months. Uh, it's part of the agreement. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to say what's law or not. I'm going to say what's inside the agreement and what's been agreed to standard of practice. I'm not familiar if that's actually become law yet. And I know a lot of people are saying the buyer, because here's the thing, buyer representation is not law. What it is, is we've agreed that we are going to be doing this. So it's mandated. We have to give a buyer rep. There has been enabling legislation that has been proposed by the California Association of Realtors to make it law in the state of California. The only ones who can make law are the is the legislative branch of our government. So right now, if you are a member of an association, if you are a realtor, you are following and doing these, these things. That is what it really comes down to. But I want to point out, it's not law, but it's probably going to become law. Now, on a personal note, I don't understand how it, what, have they passed it, Karen? January. No, I'm seeing Karen, Karen put okay. in January 1, so, but I didn't I didn't know that they even had it passed yet legislatively. I know they were proposing it still. They haven't passed it. They said it is going to pass, though. There's not a doubt about it and that we should expect it to be law January. We expect it to. Okay. Yeah, right. I just want to be clear. We, we're expecting, for all intents and purposes, this will, but I just don't want to say something is until it actually is. Right, because you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's it's not. So, um, and I'm glad Karen Van Ness is on here because I, I always reference Karen. So now I get Karen on here too. So I get to, I get to go back and forth with Karen on this one. So everybody say hi, Karen. <laughs> so um, I'm cool. I, I, I like it. I get to teach a class with Karen a little bit. Um, so the big thing is like with my friend, Tim, I signed the agreement with him, the buyer rep back in the day, and it had a specific property. You know, I can tailor this however I want to. I had a client who was looking at who I pitched an investment property to the other day. And guess what? I sent him a buyer rep agreement that just included that property so I could go show it to him. So there's all sorts of things. Get in the habit of doing this. Now, you'll notice on location, we have counties and cities. And I know that there was a, there was a lot of uh, discussion on this sort of thing with our previous agreement. You notice they've eliminated zip code from it. Or it's not in here. And look, you can put your cities, you can put in what you need to describe that property. Now, I will say this. I know agents like myself included. I work San Diego, Orange County. Um, I've worked Riverside County. I'm actually a member of associations here as well as part of the MLS, a CRMLS. And I have membership in OCAR um, up in Orange County. I legitimately do work between counties. I do work in San Diego and North County. I know people who are up in North County who work down here and work that area. The biggest thing, because I know there was arguments about some things that maybe lawyers have said and all that. Look, one, we don't say a lawyer said this because that could lead to something else because we don't know the fact pattern of that. What I will say is this, two things. You put the area that you work legitimately. And I like to put San Diego County because I do. Now, I think if I was in LA County, this might be a little bit different. Um, because obviously any of us from LA realize LA is way different than we are here in San Diego. And we take a lot of pride being San Diego versus LA. I will also say that, uh, because the argument was brought up, if you don't show every part of that County, you can't say the County. 
I don't think that's fair because if I'm showing a city and I don't show every street in that city, that doesn't mean the city's off limits to me either. Uh, city of San Diego, someone said, that's fine. But then guess what? What if I get to one of the unincorporated areas or I jump into a different jurisdiction of San Diego by going over a street? So, you know, the rule is you want to follow as what you service, but broad enough to where there's there's flexibility for the work that you're doing. OK, and at the end of the day, it's up to your broker as well, because I will bring this up to you. This agreement is with who? It's not with you. It is with your broker. So if I'm establishing an agreement and someone says, I work up and uh, I want to look at a property up in Vista, my response should be, let me check with if I really don't service that area. Let me check with my broker and see if my broker has an agent that does work that area that you could meet with possibly. And then we'll work something out. Why? Because the agreements with the broker and like I'm with like right now Caldwell Banker. I know that my office has agents in North County. So I would rather have that. That's where I give this argument in there. I think realistically, if you're putting the state of California, you, you might be in a situation if you don't reasonably work the state of California. You shouldn't do that. Um, but at the same time, I'm not an attorney and I'm not your broker. But I will say that our job is to service the client, service it the best way. So when I do it, I do put in San Diego County. I do put in, depending what they're doing, parts of, of South Orange County. And maybe I'll include for additional description, some cities. Every client is different. So just know this is designed for you to put some specific, uh, specific identification as to the property you're looking for. I don't like zip codes because like if I go into you know 92110, it's real easy for me to be in 92106 or 92107. You know? And then all of a sudden the agreement doesn't apply. I put city of San Diego, how are you going to cover the unincorporated? So just understand what you're servicing here. Um, and then you can put in additional buyer preferences and priorities. And we'll get into, I will get into the BIPP here shortly. Um, so just hold on for one second. Okay. Now, do we have excluded properties? We do. Okay, hold on. Let me, I jumped just right ahead here. Uh, we have our exclusions. And what is an exclusion of it? What are properties that are excluded from representation? Well, first and foremost, the buyer shall inform the broker in writing if the buyer has signed any other buyer representation agreement. So right off the top, I'm asking you, are you dating someone else? I don't care if we're non-exclusive or exclusive. I just want to know. Why? Because I don't know what promises were made. Wouldn't that be great if we could have that in the dating world? It'd be just amazing. Like right up front, just get a dot. Anyway, um, guys, we'd still find a way to lie. Uh, so... But I'm just saying, buyer shall disclose to broker if another broker showed buyer property, either virtually or in person. You see, if I have an existing agreement with someone like, say, Karen, you know, I have to disclose that because Karen might have an agreement to where she gets paid for either exclusive representation or for what's called broker involvement, which we're about to get into. So it's important that we ask them up front because those agreements, guess what, are, we're excluded now. Or that is excluded. There could be properties that aren't covered by our representation. We have the right to know that. So it asks these here. And that's what one through four is. And you'll notice in number four, buyer shall disclose in paragraph 2D any property for which buyer is obligated to pay another broker. This is paragraph seven. This is why you read every page of the agreement because it references and expands it. You notice our term sheet on the first page that we're going over right now just simply shows where we reference, just like in the RPA we have. We have conflicts with another broker. Broker acknowledges that for that property uh, identified in paragraph 2B, excluding any property specified, they have not entered into an exclusive representation agreement and they have no obligation, even under a non-exclusive, to pay compensation. And you have to be clear about that. Because you see, what a lot of people don't realize is that these agreements are meant to also protect us. I think we get so focused on how much is protecting the consumer that we haven't looked at what is protecting us as agents as well. Case in point being the buyer identification of preferences and priorities. You know, when I was broker for KW, I used to require the BMI, right? Yes, Tessa. Before we get too far away, we've got a question by Michael. If a buyer has a non-exclusive BRBC, a non-exclusive, with another agent, am I allowed to have them sign an exclusive with me? Uh, uh, you are, but the properties that were shown under the non-exclusive are going to not be part of that agreement. That's how I view that. I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call a third base in on this one. Karen, do you agree with that? 
Yes, you can. Yeah. However, you would be obligated to make sure you have the list of properties that have been shown, just like Mike just said. It's yeah. absolutely, you shouldn't represent anyone that signed anything unless you see what they signed to be sure what they signed and you get the properties that have been shown. And that's a good question. And by the way, you know what I keep doing here is I keep checking in with Karen because here's the reality. None of us know all of it. And we should be checking with each other to make sure. We should be checking with our brokers too, okay? Or checking with the authority. That's why I'm saying, here's my info. You can reach out to me. And if I don't know the answer, I will check it, but I'll always double check. I was 90% sure that that was the answer, but I wanted to make sure. And I know Karen studied this as much, not more than I have too. So we've really been going back and forth with this stuff. But yes, because the premise is, is that I have an exclusive, which says I get paid no matter what, which we're about to get into. But I, I've signed a previous agreement with, for all those who are curious, with say, ooh, Lydia, I'm going to pick on you. You're right in my screen, that's why. So I've got Lydia. And Lydia has signed a, had a previous agreement with, with me that she showed me some property. So guess what? My exclusive applies to any property the client buys, except for the ones that were shown by Lydia previous under that agreement. Okay. Does that make sense? So she had an agreement said these, I showed, she showed five properties. My exclusive covers everything except for those five. Okay. So that's a good question. So, um, so there we go. Now, uh, remember, these forms apply to all of us, uh, or I'm sorry, they protect all of us. They protect us as agents as well as the clients, such as, like I said, the buyer identification. As I was saying, I used to do the BMI, and BMI has changed. It was buyer uh, material issues, which is basically saying in writing what the clients want. So we have this buyer identification of preferences and priorities. And you'll notice as we, whoops, as we zoom in here, it really says the features and specifications that a client is working with. So Tessa and I have just met and we're going to start looking at properties. And I send this over to her and say, hey, Tessa, can you do me a favor? Um, either I'll fill it out and have her sign it and check it to make sure it's as we've discussed or she can complete it. And it says, these are the things that you're looking for. Primary residence, property features, how many bedrooms, how many baths. You know why? Because how many times has someone come back and said, they tried to sell me something that I didn't want? I told them I didn't want this and they kept pushing it. You know, this is meant to, and honestly, it's professional. We should have things written. We should have things documented because then there's no room for error on these. And if you change it, you amend it. Because honestly, when money's involved, people sometimes lie, sometimes forget things. And this way we have it all here. I've done exactly what you asked me to do. And that's why I like having these in there. Um, now it does have confidentiality. It says the preferences and priorities identified herein is it are intended as confidential information as that term is defined in civil code 2079.13, regardless of agency relationship. Now here we have our BMI. This is where some of the forms get a little confusing, right? Or like we have the BIPP, we have the BMI. Now we have a BMI SP because we don't have a BMI. Here's where it comes down to the BIPP is pre-purchase. So when I first meet Tessa, I'm doing a BIPP because we're right, understanding what property she's looking for, what area, what, what, speci what specifics, does she want to be close to a certain school district, all sorts of stuff. Once we go into escrow, Tessa might have some concerns about the property specific that we got the offer accepted on. That's where the BMISP comes into play, which is now I'm under contract. And I want you to tell me the things that are concerning you. I want to make sure the home has, we, we do a termite inspection. I want to make sure that, you know, um, we, they've disclosed all information, that they've, that there's no, that the, we find out the roof age, the things that are very specific to me about this property. You know, is it, you know, um, what's the traffic path? Well, all, whatever it is for due diligence. That is the difference between these two. So when it keeps coming up because people are curious, but it says here in writing, buyer disclosure, the following are material issues to the buyer regarding the property specified above. So that is why we do it. And that's the difference between the two. Remember, BIPP, which is referenced in the, the BRBC, pre-purchase. BMISP, once you go into contract. Okay, and I get to them right away. So, and a lot of people who think forms are bad, you know what forms do? You know when forms matter? when things go south. No one cares about the contract until someone starts saying they're going to sue. So that's why we always do them. It's not for the times that everything was perfect. It's for the times they weren't perfect. And unfortunately, that happens a lot. So that's why we do them. And that's why the one extra form could save you or your company a lot of, a lot of money in a lawsuit or litigation. So 
now we get to the fun part, compensation. So broker compensation, notice the amount or rate of real estate commission is not fixed by law. I am so glad they cleared that up. Did anyone love how, how it came out with the president when they said they're finally negotiable? They may be negotiable for the first time they're negotiable. Here's the reality. It wasn't explained. And that's why you can see what's being repeated in this contract is stuff that wasn't being said before. You know, that whole two and a half percent, three and a half percent standard, that's all, that's what they were saying. And they were true. They were right. We had something that was established that said, this is your fixed rate of commission. And guess what? It's negotiable. But the clients wouldn't know that offhand, which is why they're making sure that it's shown that it's not fixed by law. So you'll see it in several sections. So as I go down here, the amount of compensation, and this is the compensation that I am asking the buyer to pay me. So in this case, let's say I want to do 3%. Tessa, my fee for services is 3% of the purchase price of the home you will be buying. So um, it is not everybody charges or the minimum is or the industry standard. All those words need to be and should have been completely eliminated from your vocabulary. They don't exist anymore. They shouldn't have existed in the first place. They don't definitely don't exist now. It is your position to negotiate your commission. Now you work for a broker, so you might wanna to talk to your broker because it is a business model too, and you have to be able to make profit, but at the same time, it is fully negotiable. Now I can do it as a percentage. I can do it as a flat fee. I can have a compensation schedule. I can say I charge X amount for properties up to this purchase price. I charge X amount for properties at this purchase price. I will charge this amount if you, buy a property within 30 to 60 days or this amount if you do it later. You know, as long as you're not setting this fine expectation of certain things, you're allowed to negotiate and work out your compensation. Now, the part that people, you know, get a little con concerned at now is our payments received by broker from seller or others. So it says if broker receives compensation from seller or others, broker representation or buyer a buyer, the amount shall be credited against the buyer's obligation. But you'll notice it says here, the broker shall not receive an amount in excess of paragraph 2E1. Now, I'm sure there's some people, we got what, like, where are we at? We're, we're at the firm 100. So at 100, I'm sure someone doesn't, doesn't understand. So here's where this comes in, okay? Seller and buyer. And I always like to point this out. If I've got seller to buyer and the seller ends up purchasing the property or selling the property directly to the buyer, who gets paid commission? I used to love asking this in person. And everyone would say, oh, this agent, this agent. I go, what agent? There's no agent there. If the buyer can buy the property directly from the seller, or the seller can sell it directly to the buyer, they're going to try and do that. Why? Well, because they'll save money. But you see, the point is they pay us because we help negotiate that. We make sure that the contracts are fair. We make sure that the contracts have, have identified the needs. We've basically taken things that have value. That's why we do this. So that previous model was set up like this, where we had payment going over and then the broker would advertise and share it and all that. Now, what's going away isn't the fact that compensation can be paid for the buyer broker, but it's who pays it and how it gets advertised. Right now, they want it to go directly from the seller to the buyer. That's it. If they credit them, that's how they're going to do it. And they've eliminated CBB from the MLS or any type of public advertising. That's it. That is what's happened, okay? It doesn't mean you can't pay the compensation. It just means that the broker is not the one paying the compensation. The seller is not giving that money to the buyer broker or to the, to the listing agent who will then give it to the buyer's agent or the buyer's broker. So what's happening now is if payment is received, it goes through escrow and it's negotiated in the contract just as it would be in any other situation, okay? So the only thing that's really changed here is the advertising of compensation. And I want to make sure to point that out, but you still can receive the credit. Now, can I advertise it as um, compensation or any sort of concession? No, you can't, because that's going to lead to the same thing as of right now. Okay. So broker shall not receive any amount in excess of 2E1. So the amount that you put here, if I put 1% and somehow someone says, well, you know, I've talked to my seller and they're willing to, you know, after you made the offer, the seller's willing to pay up to 3% in, in compensation. Well, guess what? You're getting a maximum of 1%. That is it. That is all you are making on that transaction. So with that being said, know your value. Now, I'm not saying it's bad for you to put 2% or 1%, but just know your value. That's where it really comes out. Now, can I put 3% on there? And then if 
in the offer that's made, the seller says, uh, I'm only willing to pay 1%. And then can I choose to reduce the amount that I am asking for from my buyer? Yes, I can do that. Okay. Can I increase the amount? No. Can I turn around and write a new buyer representation agreement? No. You know, I've had all these questions come at me. You know, can I reduce it? Yes, I can. Can I hold firm and say they're willing to give you 1% towards the 3% obligation? I'll make it 2.5% and you pay me the other 1.5%? Yes. Can I hold firm and say you're going to pay me the other 2%? Yes. Okay. You can do what you need to do for your business. Yes, Tessa. Okay. Just to clear up, just to clear it up, the NAR settlement does not preclude, preclude one from advertising anywhere with the exception of the MLS was, did we send a conflicting message? What do you mean? It's clarify it's, that. Let me, let me look at the question. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to say you can advertise publicly. It's because here's the thing. I actually checked with Saul Klein on this one. Um, so if I advertise on Zillow or my website and it's taking off the MLS feed, then I could be in trouble for that too. So right now I'm going to say any type of public um, advertising of the commission is a no-no. And I'll even, Karen, you've heard the same thing, correct? Yeah, actually I was on the phone with CAR Legal this morning. So it's really prescriptive. It says what you cannot do, which is anything on MLS, mm -hmm. but you can off MLS. And I said to him specifically, I said, so on MLS, how would you encourage? And he said, this was this one particular attorney. He said, well, I would specifically encourage the buyer's agent to call the listing agent for further information. After they show the home, though. After they show the home, of course. Be very After clear. You don't do it before you show the home. Okay. Just, just to interject on that. Um, because I've had that question too, but you know, what I checked with Saul on was, is it, what if someone advertised online? They said, if they're doing anything that has an IDX, any type of fee to the MLS, they can't put compensation on there because it's kind of right. like a backdoor way of doing it too. So right. it can be on the broker's own website. It can be on a single property website. It can be on a flyer. Those are all things that can be on it. Just what we know that it can't be on is the MLS anything that's a vowel or an IDX. And what I would even recommend right now is right now, I, cause I'll tell you the way, and I can only say how I'm planning to do it. Um, there is so much confusion on that, that right now I'm not advertising it. I'm waiting to see what the clear language is. So period, because there's a lot of, and here's the thing, there's a caveat, like I said, with that IDX stuff. And if it's taking feed from the MLS and if it is, and then re, we're saying that out to the clients, you could find yourself in a very tricky situation. So right now, I would just, I would let it sit. There'll be more guidance that comes out, but that's how I'm recommending to do this right now. That's that's my recommendation. Um, now, again, can you tell an agent that the seller has, has it is willing to consider compensation? Uh, yeah, after they've seen the home. The point is we don't want you, that you can't be directing clients to a property based on the compensation that comes by. Does that make sense? That's the, probably the number one question is how can you do this? And, and the thing is just show the properties and have your representation that shows exactly what the compensation is and then go from there. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. I'm going to move on. So uh, continued right to payment for broker involved properties. So, and we'll get into the broker involved properties here in about two, two sections should. Yes. Um, so, what that basically says is once this agreement is done, either by expiration or cancellation, how long do I get paid for the properties I showed? And we'll define broker broker involvement. So that is what's inside here in this section. Now, if I have this filled out, it applies. Like I used to do 180 days for mine. You can do 30 days, you can do 90 days, you can do you know whatever your continuation period is. Um, now, if I don't put anything in it, it's zero. So make sure you put a, put a timeline in there. So that's the extension for when I get paid for properties that I have shown and had broker involvement, which I'll define to you here in a minute, on these properties. Now, cancellation rights for non-exclusive and exclusive. For non-exclusive, the cancellation is effective immediately upon written receipt. 
Um, the exclusive cancellation is 30 days after receipt. Okay, so if I have exclusive representation, okay, and for, so say, and this came up in a different class I was teaching. So say I sign an agreement with Tessa, 30 days later, she says, I don't, an exclusive. And 30 days later, she says, I don't want to work with you anymore, Mike. Sorry, I'm working with uh, my friend, Karen. And I'm like, that's fine. So she gives me a 30 day notice. In that 30 day period, I am still representing her. If she buys any property, I get paid. That simple. She has to wait till after the end of the 30 day to go and find and buy a property. Why? Because we have exclusive representation. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, but it's a 90, we put a 90 day exclusive on that for the term. Doesn't matter. It's the term, the maximum is 30 or 90 days and we'll be resetting it. But they can give you a notice of cancellation, but it takes 30 days. Yes, Karen. So I have also been informed that you can use the modification of term for the buyer representation to modify that cancellation to immediate upon the second oh, sign yeah. signature. Yeah, no, you can. Yeah, that's right. If you so the, the question came up, well, what if what if I don't want to work with them either? Um, then you you can do a modification and you can immediately all contracts can be adjusted, changed, whichever with mutual consent. The thing that you can't do is say you have a non-exclusive and the client sends you a cancellation. You can say, well, I'm not agreeing to that cancellation. No, they they can send it to you and that's it. You They've now canceled, they're done. They're, your, your relationship has ended. So except for the properties that you have um, already done, okay? So uh, buyer financial and personal information. This is new. Now we have our buyer uh, financial and personal information, meaning in how it's written inside of here and how we put it together. Time to deliver buyer personal financial information, right? Which is within five calendar days from the execution of the agreement and they go through CAR form BFPI, which is the buyer financial personal information form. And I get into that a little bit later when we get to that section. We've always asked for financial information to verify things like down payment, okay? To verify things like, can you, do you have the money to make an offer on the property, okay? What we haven't done, which is what we've done now, is included for in 9b does buyer have sufficient funds to pay broker does buyer intend to purchase with the following loan product which doesn't allow the buyer to pay compensation to broker okay so um and va now allows for that to be a fee but remember that's we're making sure that every avenue is covered so now it's well i'm making sure because now what is the buyer fee the buyer fee is now a cost and you have to make sure the buyer has means to pay that or if they expect you to have to ask it in the offer. Because if I ask for compensation in the offer, it is now a term of the offer, meaning that the offer can be rejected just because the seller doesn't want to pay the fee to an agent. And that's something we have to point out. That's also why the buyer has to agree to that and they agree to it through the buyer representation agreement. But we have the ability to ask, do you have the financial means to do this? Okay. So... We go into page two, and as we get into page two, we have our explanation of terms, our compensation, representation, and our timing. Karen, do you still have a question, or is your hand just still up? Oh, no, my hand's just stuck up. Thank you. No, but and I have Tessa, a yes. Yeah, I have a question. We've got two questions. So I, I really want Liz and Crystal to chime in here. So Liz, are you there? Can you chime in to clarify your question for me? If a buyer yeah, my question. Offer. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, my question is, uh, which has been proposed, we represent a lot of attorneys. That being said, whether they're antitrust or not, and them questioning whether they want to reimburse a buyer. If a buyer hires another attorney for representation that's not necessarily licensed with the DRE, but is requesting as part of the terms of the contract for reimbursement, is that something that has come up or because I've been asked that question, what's going to preclude me? Why should I pay you $100,000? I can hire an attorney for 50 grand or 30 grand to represent me. Well, um, you're, uh, yeah, that's that's a fun one. I, I've never heard the attorney being cheaper than us. Um, the attorneys are usually pretty expensive. But go, was that the whole question? Yeah. So my okay. question is, is, can a seller reimburse a buyer through the terms of an offer if they're not licensed well, for, I guess, I guess contractually, can a, can a seller credit a buyer for reimbursement if they're not being represented by a licensed agent? 
Well, see, that's, that's a loaded one, which I'd rather take a little bit offline. And here's why. So if I'm paying an attorney, I'm paying them through a retainer agreement. They're writing up the contracts of my, of my, my, my purchase. We see that in commercial all the time, right? Attorneys handle it. They do the letters of intent, the whole deal. Um, for residential sale, because now it's now it's not, but you know what that is? That's now fee for service. That's not a commission. And that's not a commission for real estate service. That's an attorney fee for the attorney writing the contract. That's why that's going to be a little different. And can that be paid out and credited? Well, we're not following that under licensure. So that's where I'm like, that's more of a, a very unique situation, depending on how they're doing. Now, if, it's, if the concern is attorneys are going to start jumping in here and start selling homes left and right, guess what? Attorneys can go Attorneys can bypass the process altogether, go get licensed. Now, the whole point is you get licensed so that you're governed by the Department of Real Estate and you're following the applicable laws, which attorneys have to do also. So, I mean, the attorney thing is kind of a separate area that I don't want to get into here for multiple reasons. I'm willing to discuss it offline with you, but I don't want to confuse people on that one because I don't think that's going to be as common. Okay. Make sense? Fair? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And that's just with a hundred of us stay on and we can discuss that one a little separate, but I, I see what you're asking, but at the same time, I think that there's multiple conflicts that could be there. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. And, and then and... Mike, we've, we've got a good question from Crystal. My answer is short and sweet. Um, Crystal, you want to ask him that question? Yeah. Hi there. Can you hear me? I can. I gotcha. Okay, good. So I just had a question in this scenario where a buyer doesn't have the financial means um, and they want to be able to put the commission, you know, request that in an offer. Um, I guess my question is, if they want to know that information before they see the property, you're saying in this scenario, you're not able to discuss those terms. You know, it's, it's not that you're not able to discuss. I can't say a specific amount. And I have heard that we can say... I'm really actually glad, Karen, because I get the second opinion on this one. Um, we can say, like, if I call you and say, hey, is your seller open to compensation if it's in the offer? Right. And I could say, depends on your offer. Go ahead and write your offer up with it. But getting specific terms of seller will cover 2% of commission is a big no-no. But me saying, is your seller open to that term? Well, yeah, you would have to put it in your offer and let's see what the totality of the offer is. You okay. see what I mean? The difference yeah. between those two? Yeah, yeah. It's just the that's the big one. What I don't want to have happen is, or what I don't think should happen was I call you and I say, hi, Crystal, I'm Mike. I have uh, my client, Karen, who wants to see the property and I have a buyer representation agreement at two and a half percent. Will you cover it? Will your seller cover it? Yes, they'll pay 2.5 in, in compensation. So that conversation can't happen that way. Yeah, I wouldn't do the conversation that way. I would say if you're if we present it on offer at the three or, or bear compensability any. You're freezing a bit there, Mike. Your offer. You so see what I mean? But you want to keep away from saying we're going to pay buyer compensation. Yeah, Mike, I think you Did I cut freeze? out. But I, Mike, you were just cutting out there a minute ago. But I think what Mike is saying, it's not is it's not a can or can't. It's a it's a suggested. It's a negotiation. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Thank you. Okay, and then we've got another question from, let's see who we have. We've got. Another question relative to the lender's role. So, Shapar, are you there? Am I here? Shapar. Yes, Shapar. yes, I am here. Hello, okay. yes, yes, I'm here. No, am I here? Can you hear me? Yes, you're there. Yeah, we yeah, can hear you're back you, Mike. Mike. <laughs> oh, okay, can I, am I moving? Am I, can you see yeah, me on the video and everything? Yeah, okay, good. Did I freeze in a very awkward, ugly position? No, no. Oh, but it never, it it's never not... freezes in a flattering pose. It's always like, oh. You know, it never does it right. Okay, good. Sorry about that, everybody. It froze on my end. So, uh, so far. I, I'm here, but my dog is barking, so that's I'm muting the the phone. The okay. Mic. Okay. Can you, all right. So her question is: Would lenders agree the buyer would agree to the buyer paying or having a role relative to paying compensation? Would the compensation amount be included in the loan, uh, or or in the compens the compensation? amount need to come from another source. So I think Mike is frozen again to answer your question, Shapar. These are definitely questions that you need to be addressing with your lenders. There are lenders out there that are getting this approved and there are conditions around how they're incorporating the compensation into, it might have to reduce the sales price. You might have to do a few things, but 
definitely consult. Okay, Mike will be back. Definitely consult with your um your preferred lender. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hey, um, hold on. Oh shoot, Mike. Oh, there you are. All right, you're muted, Mike. Mike's coming back. Mike's coming back. Um, I'm so to... sorry, you guys. I don't know what happened there. So if okay. it happens again, I'll make an adjustment. I apologize. I'm having COVID flashbacks now for some reason. All right, we good? We're good. And then Brad, okay. you had a question about what about the following areas of representation, such as commercial property and rental property, relative to what, Brad? To Relative to what, Brad? I'm just Data. basically, is can we, you know, because in commercial property and also in um, residential um, leases or tenancy properties, um, there's always been compensation offered as well. So do all these rules apply to those two no, areas? This is, this is residential only. When, now, residential one to four units. So if I'm using a residential one to four and I'm doing that sale that way, even though that in, in a, it's an investment property, that's going to be covered by this. If I'm okay. doing commercial property, retail, anything, that's that's separate. Commercials already have this. So this is just and residential property. What about rentals? Uh, rentals are covered by this if it's a residential one to four. Okay, so then same same thing of compensation for that then. Correct. For, for Anything least. that's a residential one to four. Now, if I've got a 10 unit apartment building rental, then that's a commercial building. That's going to follow the from okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, Perfect. okay then, then last right. question by Sharon. Sharon, are you there? The ABR class? Sharon? I'm just, I'm nervous with my, I don't want my internet to crash again. So if it does- That's okay. I, we'll just, yeah. we'll buy time and we'll wait okay. for you to come back. So Sharon's okay. question is the ABR class taught us to pre-ask the question when the buyer states to show the home, to show home to sh Sharon, to show homes only um, and that they don't have to ask the buyer, buyer's agent for company. I, Sharon, you're going to have to clarify this. Let's move on. Yeah, we'll, move on. we'll come back to it. I'm going to push the questions just a little bit because I see there's a whole line of them coming in. We'll, we'll, and trust me, I promise you, I will stay. We'll get to every question at the end. I promise you. Yeah, well, we I just wanted to any. cover compensation, but Sharon. Yeah, we'll absolutely. Come we'll, we'll come back to it. So I know right. there's going to be some that are very specific and a lot of those we're going to we're going to come back to. But here we go into compensation page two, right? So right here at the very top, broker compensation advisory. I will go over the broker compensation advisory with you shortly. It is in my opinion, it is a great form when you're doing the, your 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 pit of the BRBC, and I'll show you why. Okay, but before we get there, compensation to broker. You'll notice this recurring theme again. What is it? Real estate commissions are not fixed by law. They may be negotiable between parties. We keep hearing that over and over again, right? They include compensation and fees and are fully negotiable. Again, right below the previous. So as I look here. Um, broker's right to compensation. What gives you the right to be compensated? It's I enter into an agreement and the seller there, thereafter is new, completes the transaction. Okay. So it's not just that. It's, it's my buyer enters into the agreement and then completes it. That's what should do it. Okay. Now there's other clauses that come into that, but you'll notice this isn't in red. This is black. This has been there. This is not brand new. So now the other caveat though, which has always been there, or is prevented by doing so or from doing so by default. So if something prevents that closing from happening that was out that say maybe the buyer did something like I had a situation once and I got to be careful because I'm not an attorney. We're not giving legal stuff here. But I will say I had a situation once where a buyer did something with the seller to get out of buying that property. And guess what? They went outside of all of us and they kind of interfered in that. And technically, we brought the buyer, we were entitled to compensation that was handed off to the broker and said, you guys handle this. Just remember, following contracts means you get paid. If they're able to cancel or if something happens by default, that could, or if they cancel and they do it right and correctly and following the proper procedure, no issues. If something funky happens, you've still done your work and done your job. So that's a situation you would talk to your to, to broker about. So people always laugh at me when I say that, I go, well, brought the buyer technically you know, there's a lot of things that come into it but, um now here's the thing when we get into non-exclusive and exclusive representation non-exclusive compensation is payable only if there was broker involvement so we have to get down this whole thing again this is where i get to my fun charts i always do so here's broker involvement i have buyer representation 
Okay. So what is buyer representation? By agreement now, we have either non-exclusive or exclusive. So if I have non-exclusive, I have what's called broker involvement. I'll give you another term that I'm sure many of you have heard. Uh, procuring cause. Everybody loves saying that one, right? I love, I love how realtors always want to be attorneys and say that stuff because it's very hard to define this thing. Procuring cause is, and I'm sure a lot of people think they can define it. It's I'm the reason that you seen this property, I introduced it to you, so on and so forth. See, the problem is, is that we have to define what procuring cause is. Otherwise, just a bunch of people screaming, I showed that to you, I showed that to you, I showed that to you, et cetera. So we actually define with the BRBC what broker involvement is. And it says right here, broker involvement, compensation is only payable if there was broker involvement. Well, what is it? Buyer, or I'm sorry, and then we switch over to exclusive, and exclusive is what's called buyer acquisition. So simply, I have the buyer, I get paid. But here's broker involvement. Wherever using the agreement means any of the following. The buyer physically entered and was shown the property by the broker. The broker showed the property to the buyer virtually. So I went in with my phone and I did a, I did a whole FaceTime call and showed them all the avenues and the whole thing. Um, I submitted an offer to acquire a lease or exchange or obtain the property or get an option to it. So I actually submitted an offer for them or I performed a market analysis related to it, or the property was introduced to the buyer by broker or for one of which the broker acted on the buyer's behalf. Now, all these things sound great. The better thing to understand is what is it not? Okay, you know what broker involvement is not? It is not merely sending the buyer a list of properties is not deemed broker involvement, okay? So if I just send you an email, so Allie's my buyer and she got an email from me, Guess what? She might have also gotten an email from Tessa, from Karen, from Ola, from Brad. She might have gotten auto send from Zillow. She could have had 20 different places that were telling her that this property was for sale. So until the first one who's actually done work on that property for her, that is broker involvement there. Unless I've actually taken the time to, to put the effort in to get her that property or negotiate it for her, that is not broker involvement. Okay. So that's why it's very clear. We've actually defined what is broker involvement for terms of am I what's what, what people like to reference as procuring cause. And that's the big thing. So that's why I'm showing your buyer representation, non-exclusive. You have to have broker involvement. And that's very, very important because if they cancel or termination happens, what you're doing, which is what Karen was bringing up earlier too, you have to send the notice of broker involved properties. So Allie's my client. I showed her like, you know, she got a list of like, you know, over the course of us, us working together, like 200 properties. And of that 200 properties, I showed her 30. Okay. Actually physically either negotiated, placed offers on or virtually or in person showed her those properties. Okay. Um, whatever's defined as a broker involvement. As soon, within a few days of her canceling, I sent her this notice of broker involved properties. And I want to do it sooner rather than later because it gives her the notice that by the way, if you go sign an agreement with someone, which you're going to have to do now moving forward, here's the properties that I still get paid for. As long as I check that box, it said it was within X number of days for the longstanding payment after the termination of the agreement. Does that make sense? So I have to give you this. I used to say, look, if it really comes down to it, if it hits the fan, you get, just send an email that says, these are the properties I had broker involvement on with you and then get them to send this over. But you want to notify the others. You want to notify the client, the buyer. Sucks we're not working together, but here's the notice of broker involved properties. In that example that, that came up earlier of what if you have an exclusive and you've agreed to terminate your agreement early, you would then agree to the termination, but you would also say, here's the notice of all the properties I showed you. If you enter into an agreement with someone else in the time frame afterwards, I get paid for this. My brokerage does. And that's what has to be disclosed at the beginning. So, so Mike, th there's a question if um, doing a CMA counts as broker involvement, and then I'm going to add to that question is, is there a tier? So uh, providing a list, providing a CMA, but then is that trumped by actually showing the property? So no. Well, I think the most, the most indicative thing is going to be, I showed you the property, but if I sent it to you, see, here's the logic. Allison, you're my client. You've sent me, I've sent you a list of properties and why would I do a CMA on it, Right. If I just did a CMA because I think this is a cool property for you and I sent it with the list of properties, I, I think that would that would gander somewhere. If you've responded back to me saying, hey, I like one, two, three, four Main Street, 
What do you think the value is? And I go and do a CMA for you. I think now we have broker involvement. You see what I mean? I think it's going to, that's a little more of a, depends on other things to make it. I have the involvement there. So, so it sounds a little bit more like if it's interactive versus the agent pushing correct. out information, it's actually when the buyer responds and they interact and the buyer makes a request. That's what I believe. And it's, it's, it's the whole thing of, are we, are we actually involved in it? What we want to avoid is that whole situation of, you know, Tessa's saying just because she's right there in front of me, Hey, you know what? Allie bought, you bought that property through Allie, but I emailed it to you. Well, what did you do? You know, we didn't have an agreement and we had a non-exclusive and I chose to buy it through Allie who did all this work. Well, it came on the email. Well, it came on a drill or I sent it to you. Okay. But I didn't really respond. I didn't, you know what I mean? That's where we have to kind of outline. And it's there because people have sued on this. So that's, this is where it's outlined. This is why we do the BRBC before at least was to outline the parameters of what's involvement to define that scope. And again, that protects you too. Look, the, the real estate's competitive. So we have to make sure we have something outlining our relationships. Okay. Good questions. Um, uh, so that is form MVP now, or MBIP. Now, look, I'll even go as far as to say this is one of the forms where I'm like, look, if you physically can't get to your car forms and you need to send, I would send an email that says that's fine per agreement or per the buyer representation. Here's the notice of broker involved properties that I did. And I would send that to them. Now, does this have to be acknowledged by them? No. Email receipt is deemed received once you send it. So you want to just notify them. So the question always comes up, well, what if the buyer doesn't sign and acknowledge it? You're the one who sent it over to them. So you're just notifying them. These are the properties that we had broker involvement on per the agreement. And then let your broker take it from there if there's an argument. Okay? Okay. So timing of compensation upon completion of any resulting transaction through escrow. Okay? Um, and then when is buyer entitled to compensation? Well, whether or not escrow resulting from the agreement closes, depending if there was something that, that kept it. Um, the acquisition, if the acquisition is prevented by a party of the transaction other than the buyer, I'm going to sum this one up. If say there's something that kept it from closing, there's a lawsuit, there's damages, you could be, you could possibly receive compensation based on a percentage of the award that was given to the buyer based on what you've agreed to be paid. So say someone gets paid $10,000 and your agreement was 2.5%, guess what? You get 2.5% of that possibly. That's something, the reason I skipped through these is situations like this where they go to court aren't going to involve you unless you're the broker of record handling that. So in this situation, you would speak to your broker, but it's in the agreement because it's given to the buyer. The buyer knows that they've been made aware it's part of the contract. That's why I want you to know it, okay? So accounting for payment to broker, if broker also represents the seller. This section I deliberately go over in F because it's a little confusing. If I read it just at face value, it says, if broker has a signed listing agreement with the seller of the property to be purchased, buyer shall not receive a credit for the compensation seller owes broker for representing the seller. You know what that sounds like? You can't do dual representation. You know what it actually is? If you're the seller or seller's agent and you have an agreement through a listing agreement for compensation, Awesome. If you represent the buyer, awesome. You need a buyer representation agreement that says what you're going to get paid from the buyer. And if you want to get paid from the seller for the buyer representation, you need to include it in the offer just like anyone else would. That's what that is saying. It's saying I can't start. So if my agreement says 5% for representing the buyer, you can't do that. You have to put your normal seller commission, and then do the buyer representation. You can't agree in advance to have compensation as the buyer's agent. And I hope that makes sense. Okay. So that's what that says in there. That one confused me and I had to check into it a little bit on that. So um, that's all that's saying. You can still do dual agency, but just remember, we've separated the two now. So I'm working at open house, do my agreements, have a buyer who comes in. I have an agreement with them. They want to place an offer. Guess what? I'm discussing compensation with them and I am presenting it to the seller. Okay. So uh, here we go for payments received from others less than compensation. I'm going to skip down here to this, this illustration. This is the RPA, our purchase agreement page two. Okay. Right here in G1, it says broker and buyer should discuss whether it'd be beneficial to include a term if any offer buyer makes obligating seller to pay broker directly through escrow or for some other compensation that buyer owes broker. We want to make sure it's discussed. Why? 
if I include payment to me in the offer I've made for Allie, okay, to Tessa as the seller, and Tessa loves every term of that offer, except for the payment of my compensation, that offer is rejected. If it's countered, that offer has been initially rejected. And now in that time it's been rejected, Ola comes in with an offer that doesn't have that and her offer gets accepted. Guess what? Allie's really ticked at me right now because it's my fee that made her offer get rejected. But it becomes a term. And that's why we have this in there, okay? So they have to agree to it. The buyers have to know that that now becomes a term of the agreement if they choose to. They owe you money. It's a closing cost. For all intents and purposes, it's a cost. They have to make sure they can they can handle paying that, or if they want to include it to be paid by the seller, the seller can reject it. And that's where we would use in the in the contract here. This is three G three. We all I don't know if any of you have heard, or if you're not familiar with it, here say use three G three, use three G three. The whole world fell apart, didn't it, Tessa, Allie, Karen? Two years ago, when we included three G three, everybody it was like fire and brimstone, right? Like, how can you do that? Well, guess what? This is how you're going to get paid now. Car was actually a little more forward thinking on it and said, we're gonna incorporate this in. And so now it should be something that you see and you're regularly associated with. If I wanna get paid, so when I said, as a listing agent, I am preparing my buyers or my sellers to know that they may get offers that include for payment of compensation. It says here, 3G3 will be checked. It said seller, um, seller credit, if any, to buyer, but then below that, Seller agrees to pay the obligation of buyer to compensate buyer broker under a separate agreement. And then here was what we have from that. We have now the form SPBB, which has been revised. Hey, it could be worse. It's not like all the, uh, what was it? The peds we had during COVID. Those drove all of us crazy. So it could be worse. <clears throat> see, I see the heads nodding again. Yeah. So here's where this comes in. And I'll give you guys another example of something. So I want to make an offer to, let's see, I want to make an offer to Brad, right? And in making my offer to Brad um, through my agent, my agent, I have a BRBC. The BRBC says I'm going to get paid 2%. Okay, I'm trying to pick random numbers so you guys can't say I was giving you a standardized thing. Uh, 2%. Actually, you know what? Screw it. I, I did my offer and my buyer representation says I'm getting paid 7%. Okay, you see, I saw you all look up. It was awesome. Uh, 7%, right? And we've included that in our offer. So I included 3G3. And in doing so, I also included the seller payment to buyer broker form SPBB, which you have to give if you're asking for compensation. Okay. It says there that we have a buyer broker agreement. It says that that buyer broker agreement says I'm going to get paid as the buyer's agent 7%. And now my buyer, Brad, is asking for you as the seller, Allie, to pay that or to agree to that. Now, I'm not giving the BRBC. I will give the BRBC during escrow, okay? I am giving you an SPBB that says under penalty, or basically under the statute of frauds, and as an agent, it's not a penalty of perjury, but here's the reality of it. If you lie as an agent when submitting forms, you have committed fraud, which means your insurance isn't going to cover you if there's a suit later. Okay. So Karen. Um, I was just going to say that one of the things that I'm doing when I submit my SPBB is I'm attaching page four where it has the confirmation of commission um, along with the SPBB and my I have a, a sheet that I've created on the value I provide to the seller and the seller's agent mm -hmm. to further encourage them to sign my SPBB. But that's yeah. just my own practice. Yeah. No, no. And I was going to add, because um, this came up in one of the other class I taught, if you want to, here's the thing. It's not that you don't have to, or it's not that you have to, you don't have to. Or like what I've done, and I've done that too, I've included that one page in there just so that there's no question. Because there have been agents who, let's be real, some agents, I know it might come as a surprise to some of you, there are some agents who do some shady stuff. Um, but that got sent over with it. So, you know, you don't have to send over the BRBC. You are sending over the, the SPBB. But just know, if you do lie on that SPBB, if you don't have an agreement that says what, what that payment is, you're you're doing stuff you shouldn't be doing and that could have repercussions for you, severe ones. So don't do that. Do you know what the fines are? No, what's the fine? 
CRMLS, it's a $2,500 fine and SDMLS is $1,500. Well, that's if you lie on the SPBB? It, no, if you do not have a buyer representation agreement signed. Oh, no, no. I'm saying what if they lie about the compensation on the SPBB and all that stuff? That's, oh. that's yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> the better the one. Yeah, that's the better one. So, uh, or meaning that's the one. But yeah, and I'm glad you brought up those fines. You have to have a representation agreement. So, and there's fines accordingly for it. So um, just know where the SPBB comes into play. You submit it if you're using 3G3. And guess what? If you have a, um, a, a broker representation, which you have to have, okay? So broker compensation advisory form, which is form BCA, which is right here. Here's, it's used, this is a new form and it's used to explain how brokers are paid in a real estate transaction. So number one, issues for a seller and their agents to consider. Section two, issues for the buyer and their agent to consider. And then section three, which is different ways in which the buyer broker can get paid. That's why I actually, I actually like this form. You don't hear me say that a lot on some of these, but this with the disclose is a disclosure. But I like it because as I'm going over this, I can actually say, here's how all these questions come into play. So here's my issues is section one, issues for the seller, negotiable commission, compensation for unrepresented and possible dual agents. Remember dual agency didn't go away yet uh issues for the buyer and their agent to consider which is your commission is negotiable again I, oh could no you, am i breaking up again i gotta notice my internet's unstable yeah you cut out a little bit if you wouldn't mind repeating that please i'm sorry i don't know what's going on with the internet here i i hear someone told me mercury's in retrograde again i don't know yeah it, it is <laughs> so i apologize okay well I'll go as long as i have to to make sure everybody's got this um uh i'm sorry commission is negotiable compensation if you're unrepresented Represent if you have an unrepresented buyer, that is not the same as dual agency. That is a buyer who is choosing not to have an agent, okay, or who who brings you an offer and does that. So, what's the compensation for unrepresented as a listing agent? Because the theory is, I can add on to that. I can say I'm I'm doing things, but I'm not representing them. And then there's dual agency. The possibility there may be dual agency. Um, the next one is broker agreement with buyer, negotiable commissions written agreements, the requirements and the advantages therein of having a written agreement, not to mention that you just have to do it. But a written agreement, as it says here, establishes a clear mutual expectation and avoids misunderstandings over the buyer and broker duties for compensation. And then the third section, different ways in which the buyer broker can get paid. I can get paid because the buyer pays the broker directly. I can get paid as a broker because uh, the seller did it through using the RPA, which is 3G3. OK, and unrepresented can ask via the buyer's agent. So, again, we would have it put through and, and gone forward. So everything has to be disclosed, written up and agreed to and negotiated. That's the biggest part of this. That's why I like the BCA, because it gives that. So. Um, so, yes, Karen. So um, something else I talked to Car this morning about is unrepresented buyers, because mm -hmm. I think this is a landmine. So. Mm -hmm. it I agree. If they're unrepresented, they need the forms in order to write an offer. So we can give them the forms, but arguably they may be challenged in completing the forms. If they ask- well, Let me ask you a question because I, I, hold on. I brought this up before you came on. Can we give them the forms? Because Yes, we can this give is them. This when I checked it, it since okay. it's a license, it's completely for the licensing, can we give them? We can give them the yeah. forms. Okay, so okay. if you are a B and A, I've had, I've had different answers on that. Okay, if you're a B and A, you can give them the forms as a buyer non-agent. But what you cannot do is mm -hmm. answer any questions about any form or any field that they have to complete. So, as the attorney for so CNA, you just give them the forms and they fill it out blank. Right, as the but. But then you can't answer questions about inspections, disclosures. So as the attorney for CAR said this morning, if a buyer's unrepresented and they 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 need the forms. So it's like, okay, you can do a BNA, but that's pretty sketchy because they're going to ask questions you can't answer. Otherwise, you create agency by answering questions. You could then you could be a dual agent or a dual brokerage. 
which you would want to clear with your broker, you know, is it okay for you as an agent to be a dual or does the brokerage want to be a dual and they'll send another agent out to represent the buyer. But here's the analogy the attorney used. It's like going to the doctor and the doctor says, well, I hear what your symptoms are. I'm going to do some tests, but I'm not going to do them all. And I'm going to give you some medication, but I'm not going to give you it all. So no. it no. sounds like they're really trying to help buyers understand that they need representation in order to get questions answered, guidance on inspections, guidance on disclosures, and guidance on filling out all these forms. Because all we can do is give them the forms and that's it. Yeah. And, and it's important, and I, I appreciate you chiming on that, because it's important that we recognize, one, that you have to use the, the form BNA, the buyer non-agency, okay? And if you don't know what that is, go look it up. We're expecting to see more of these. That's just, and what I think you should do is as a listing agent, pitch the value of your service as an agent or see if they can find some form of, of representation. If that comes down to it, maybe another agent in your office and you guys all figure something out. There's a lot of things that can be done as long as you're negotiating that compensation. But just know if you do get it, and I'm glad you're able to, I've been trying to get a clear answer. I've had different attorneys tell me different things with the licensing on that. And so it's, the bottom line is if you give a form, you cannot advise them how to complete it at all. And it's, that's it, period. Okay, so, and they, they're allowed to make an offer. They can do it themselves. Uh, oh, we lost oh. you again, Mike. Whatever they want. I would talk my Mike, your uh, your screen's still sharing, but we're having a little trouble hearing you. You're freezing. Okay, I just texted him and told him to log out and log back in again. Karen, did you have a question? No, I forgot to lower my hand. Sorry. Okay, so we <laughs> we've got a couple questions while he's getting back in. Karen, maybe you can chime in here. Um. If that's okay. Sure, absolutely. Okay. All right. Can uh, I ask a question? Yep. Um, if um, if if a buyer uh, don't represent, oh, I'm sorry, I represent, but they want to go see open houses in a day, do I give a representation, the um, buyer broker representation, um, for a zip code, or do I have to identify the properties? You do not have to identify the properties, although you sh you need to keep a record of them. But you can either use a buyer broker, a buyer representation agreement, or you can use the PSRA, which is the, let me see, okay. property showing and representation agreement. So that's like a, it's the short form of a BRBC. It's only good for 30 days. And it's non-exclusive, but you can use that and you can use that for up to three properties. Oh, okay. Karen, we've got Mike back. Mike, welcome oh, back. Not All Karen, right. Hopefully Mike, that's the last Mike. time that happens. So okay. if it does, then I'll have to figure out something to reset it. So I'm just going to jam through and that way I'm, I'm not stalling out on the questions or anything. Okay. That work. Okay. So we're, we're so I asked Todd to raise his hand for a question. Did you want to power through and then I'm open gonna power up. through and then we'll come back to the question if that's okay Todd. Q &A, Todd. I want to make sure we'll be okay back. thank you go ahead so sorry about that <laughs> I can't control technology man it's like 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 the DOJ we just can't control them um so okay <laughs> buyer and seller must separately oh sorry so buyer and seller must separately negotiate compensation this is that changing practice as I was talking about in the BCA and that's all we're really saying can you have dual agency yes separately negotiated we want the stream separate from everything so in terms of cancellation, either buyer or broker, back to the RPA, bottom of page two, top of page three, either buyer or broker may cancel this agreement at any time with written notice, as long as it's within the time specified, okay? So, and I could still be required to, or entitled to compensation, as long as it's within the parameters we've established previous in the agreement, okay? So, as I moved on, we've already talked about agency, so I'm going to skip past that section here. And we have um, discussed, wait, we've discussed agency relationship. We have discussed properties excluded from representation. So I'm going to keep going through this. Remember, if there's a previous agreement, that is what we're worried about. Okay. Did I make an agreement with Karen on this? 
Did I have something where there was a list of what? The MBIP, right? The Notice of Broker Involved Properties. Now it should be making more sense to you, okay? There we go, okay. And then my broker authorizations and obligations. Guess what? These haven't changed. Broker agrees that's the only line to exercise reasonable effort and due diligence to achieve the purpose of the agreement. But still, it outlines what we do. We locate properties. We order reports and investigations as directed by the buyer. We, upon request, provide the buyer with a list of professionals who perform services. We can give them um, ideas for lo from loan officers, home inspectors later. This is what allows us to do that without the, oh, you're just trying to push someone on me. It's no, this is part of the scope upon your request. I can do that. Um, it allows us to do our reasonable inspections. It says to the buyer, these are the things we do in the scope of our duties to you. And that's not new. Now, as we get down to the buyer obligations, acting good faith. So if you, I would say, if you have an issue with me, just talk to me about it. Let's have a conversation. But if you're also saying that you're going to present an offer on this home, you have means to purchase that property. Why? Because the time I'm spending with you is time I'm not spending with someone else. And this is how I feed my family. So this is my job that I do. My investment. I always say I invest in you just like you're investing in a property. So I'm putting my time and effort to help you get what you want here. So it says the financial and personal information. I'll skip to within the time specified and go to number two. If either box is checked for any property in which buyer writes an offer to purchase, the buyer agrees to include a term in buyer's offer requesting seller to compensate broker and for a transaction, this agreement is contingent upon seller or others agreeing to pay broker the full amount that buyer's contractually obligated. So this is the one that's enabling those lines that says, look, you have money and you understand you might be obligated to pay me. Do you want us to include that offer in here? Do you we do you have the financial means of this to make it happen? And here's where it is, which is the buyer financial and personal information, which says amount of deposit available, amount of down payment available. Source of your funds, source of additional funds, lender information, if you already have that, okay? Um, other financial information and your personal information. So it's asking for this so we can put this all together for them. And also so we can understand the source of funds, which we were already doing before. The difference is now we're also looking to see, can you pay the compensation to me? Which by the way, that's important because we're investing our time and money into finding them get a property. If we have to include it in the offer, then guess what? We include it in the offer, but we should know that that's where it is up front. Okay. I'm still there, right? Okay, yeah. good. I want to yeah. make sure I'm seeing the nods. I just want to make sure. And just tell me if it freezes in a weird, you know, face. That's all I care about there too. Okay. So remember two authorizes three G three. That's why I'm trying to show you how these all connect in the buyer representation agreement. Nine, two authorizes use of 3G3. It is disclosing to them that they're agreeing to do this. It's saying, hey, if I do, because why? I've now made a term in the contract that says your offer could be rejected because of paying me. So you have to be aware of that. Page four talks about all things such as buyer material issues, which we've gone over. And by the way, uh, here's the BMI section, which says if buyer does not provide such information for a property, the property shall be deemed to satisfy the buyer's material considerations. Okay, so if they don't give you one, by signing this BRBC, they're saying, hey, I haven't given you a BMI SP. Guess what? Property's good. I'm agreeing to it. So not they're agreeing, but they're saying that there's nothing that they really want to focus or they'll go through their normal inspections. So management approval, paragraph 11, or section 11 here, which is important, management approval and the associate licensee and broker's office enters into this agreement on broker's behalf. Broker or manager has a right to cancel it within five days after the execution. So when would that happen? I signed a BRBC for a quarter percent. Maybe my manager saw that, said, why are we doing that? You know, um, it's a hundred thousand dollar property. I, you're an agent in my office. We're going to take all these, but whichever manager or there's a clause in there they don't agree with management can actually terminate this agreement five days after that's also in the residential listing agreement so so we also have dispute resolution not new which says and there's no space where someone cannot agree to it by default this agreement has dispute resolution 
So as you agree to mediation and then of course additional terms, what's exempt from that if it's already in court, small claims, probate, things of that nature, bankruptcy filings. We do have, whoops, the lead, sorry, the, let me back up. We have our legally authorized signer, which I'll let you read through. That's if you have like a trust or anything of that nature. And then as we go down here, we have our last page, which is our exclusive representation. Now it should make sense at the very top. Here's the exclusive representation. They do have to initial it. And it also talks about compensation again. So it's reiterated and it has a comp, whoops, has a confirmation of compensation. Buyer confirms that the compensation specified for broker services is, okay? And it says again, what it is. There's no question about this. Um, then down here, I'll let you guys read through if it's a trust or anything. You guys can, this is pretty self-explanatory on its own in the red line. Now, whoops, I am having a tech issue today. It's weird. So here's our exclusive. And then down here for our buyer acknowledgement and their signatures. Now, the buyer transactional advisory has not changed. This was released at early year. This is um, informational only. Buyer responsibilities have due care. Get help if you need to read your documents. Notify the broker of important considerations. A reminder about what is dual agency and what the agents will and will not do. The additional bundled forms, you'll notice a change in the old forms. We used to have them front loaded. So it had the um, agency, then it had all these ones. Now it's just agency, then the document, RPA is the same way, and then the bundled forms at the end. So here we have the, uh, the BIA, which is the Buyer Information Advisory, the possible representation of more than one buyer or seller, disclosure and consent, and then the CCPS for sharing of information. Okay, so those are not new. They're just referenced in there. Uh, in my opinion, the two top ones, BIA and the PRBS, are very important forms that you should understand. And with that, I have it broken up again, so we're good. Now I'll get into questions, and I'm sorry for any technical issues. I know I went a little faster there. I just didn't want it to break up, and I can see as many faces as I can starting to get a little tired. So um, are we still there? Allie, are you there? Yep, sorry. You're still okay. here. Tessa, are you still there, or do you, 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 you ghost me? Tessie, you were my question giver. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my information if anyone wants it, and I'll put it in the chat too. I'm going to stay back now and answer questions for you. Um, I'm actually really grateful for some people that are on here. I'm grateful Karen took some time to jump in. If anyone doesn't know her, she is the chair of education for SDAR. Um, I've gotten to know and respect Karen greatly over the last few years. And so and I'll always say collaboration is your best asset in this business. You have to have people you can trust and work with who understand and are willing to say, hey, here's where we're at. Because that's how we're going to get through this. Remember, 10% okay. to 90%. So go on, You Tessa. got it, Mike. We, I had to do a little transition from one room to another. Um, now, we do have questions. So Todd, I think it was Todd, you guys, get those questions, get those hands in the air. Here we go. Okay, right. so we can power we'll, we'll through those We'll just do rapid questions. fire. I'll just, I'll take them for you. you. So how's that? Okay. Okay. You want, you want me to read through them or you, you just want to tell me? No, no, no. Todd, I want, if you guys have a question in the chat box, now is the time to raise your hand and we'll go through your questions. There you go. Okay. I'm going to scroll through them here. Hold on one second. Todd, right. I know you're coming. Oh yeah. Todd, Let's just do question. it that way. So um, I'm just going to go left to right. Uh, I'll start with Mark. Okay. Mark, you're on mute. There we go. All right. Uh, hi. Go. Uh, how would you have the seller counter the SPBB to the buyer? I've called Carr, uh, the attorneys, they were very vague about it. Um, how would you have the, so let's say you make a, the buyer makes an offer of compensation to their agent for 2% and the seller counters back 1%, where should that counter be? In the counter offer. Just, to, it's part of the contract. Yeah, that simple. Just say seller willing to pay, compens seller willing to pay compensation um, up to 1%. Okay. Yeah, Thank that's you. that's all. Because you're not countering the SPBB. The SPBB is, for all intents and purposes, more like a, dis in my opinion, it's more like a disclosure. It's saying, I have another form here, and that form says I get paid. So rather than send the BRBC, you're sending over the SPBB. So you, But what you're actually countering is the offer, because it's, in, it's empowering the offer to have the offer of compensation. So you would just simply do it as a counteroffer. Okay, good. Thank you. So use SCO or SMCO. And that's important too, because you can have an SMCO and that you can have different SMCOs. So it would just be on that one specific. Okay. Got it. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
And please make sure to drop your hands when, you're, when your question has been answered. Otherwise, we'll get confused. So okay. Portia, you're next. I'm just going left to right on my screen. Sorry. Perfect. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Sweet. Okay. So I typed this out. It's kind of specific. I just was wondering. So if a listing oh, is I'm... offering. Yeah. I just said like if a listing. Oh, no. Is... I was going to see if I can find it. But yeah. 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 It's not too far from the bottom. No, no. Go ahead. If a listing is offering. Yeah. So like if a listing is advertising a specific compensation outside of MLS, it's not anywhere where we can get in trouble for it. When is it permissible to obtain like the compensation agreement, the SPBB, the SP, if it's a FISBO? So like I've been under the impression that like before you even go out, you want to get on the phone and ask them. But it sounds like from what you're saying, that might be interpreted as steering or don't get that information up front and have it influence whether you show the property or not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, right. that's a matter of best practice right now. Like I said, okay. this is okay. a little more confusing. And so, I'm yeah, gonna say, like just when it's being specifically offered at a certain amount, I'm wondering, Hey, can I get that in writing before I even show the place so that we have an idea, you know, of like no, how much the see, fee is going to be. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's the kicker. Okay. Like I said it right okay. there. Yeah. That's where I'm going to, and this is something I'm going to say, I'm out on a limb saying this one. This is just, you know, sure. sometimes you take everything, you put it into a hole. The mm -hmm. second you say outside before I've shown the property, I think you're right. starting to get yourself in trouble. You okay. don't want to go okay. down that road. So then when, I mean, if, if they're offering it as a specific amount and it's not an MLS, I don't want to do it before the showing. So I want to do it after the showing, come offer time, and now it becomes a negotiable. Or... Let me let me ask you a question. Oh, oh okay. Sure. I thought I thought you said something else. So I'm sorry. Um, no, yeah, no, you, you go see the property. The whole point is, as agents, I have a buyer. I've made an agreement with my buyer. My right. buyer is paying me for services. Sure. We're going to go and find property for them. And then in the course of that offer, okay, we're either going to ask for that compensation or mm -hmm. not ask for that compensation if they okay. want. So it's okay. basically like, think of it as they have fees. And in that they're asking, it's, right. it's the same thing as we're now making offers that include for fees. Okay? Exactly. exactly. So that's all it is. Where you get into trouble is when you're, you know, and it's like, I see, well, they're advertising it outside of MLS and all sorts mm -hmm. of other stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to touch all that. I want to keep it at the, at the main crux right now, which is we have it to where it can't be in the MLS. And as right. far as the buyer representation agreement goes, I have an agreement and I cannot show property. With, no matter, I cannot show property without having, as an agent, without having a buyer mm -hmm. representation agreement done. And okay. I should not, not be showing property because whether or not someone has offered to give compensation. Got you. So, okay. Okay, so that just can't even factor into your decision that's as to my, whether that's or not my, to show. That's my recommendation. Got you. Got Correct. you. So it's really just bring that's it in, come offer time, and if they're offering it and it's specified, then we fill it in, and hopefully it's non-negotiable. But there could be for whatever. Well, purpose, and that's the whole point. It's going to become negotiable. Exactly. It's okay. going to be okay. Well, here's the offer being presented over to the seller, and the seller's gotcha. going to go from there. But gotcha. as far as on-market, off-market properties, I'm not even going to touch all that. I'm going to say that gotcha. we know it can't be on the MLS. We right. know that there's 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 issues about a lot of this stuff. And the bottom line is what I don't want to have happen, or what I don't think anyone should be doing is getting in the habit of saying, okay, we're going to go and check and only the properties that are paying that compensation. Yeah, are got you. Because I think that starts getting us into a gray zone. But okay. let me, I'm going to chime over to Karen because I, I know her and I've talked about this one too. So yeah. Karen, go for it. So the DOJ does not want anybody to know what the offer of compensation mm -hmm. to the buyer's agent is until it's negotiated in a purchase agreement. Wow. Okay. And here's Period. something to think about right now. So I just ran a, I ran a test on, um, on a, on a listing and I put zero to see yeah. if I would get people that would either call me or even come look at the property right. as agents. I got zero people showing it. Now, what they wow. didn't know is that my seller's completely open to paying, but right. nobody, nobody yeah. Know it. So as soon as I put something in the MLS, then they showed up. But here's the bigger thing down the road. It could say zero, but with the right offer, that's our job as a oh, buyer's sure. agent, yeah. mm -hmm. negotiate. That's so, true. and that's what the DOJ is driving to. And by the way, this isn't a done deal because they still have not weighed in. So more than likely, we may lose the ability to have any knowledge of it, but it's better if we just if you your client likes it, then you submit your your write it in. okay or confirmation. Go for it. Negotiate okay. your value to get compensated. Awesome, great. And that's the whole thing. Line. I mean, the, the bottom line is, and like I said, now you're going to hear the term uncoupling that's been coming up mm -hmm. too. Okay, and that yes. means that they want to completely, you know, don't focus on all the stuff right now. Like like Karen said, like I've been saying in here, like many of you should know at this point. 
you know, the bottom line is, and that's, that's where it kind of guides the, the thought process with some of the questions. It's, mm-hmm. are you in any way steering that? How many times, like she had said, how many times have we done an offer? Like I've had it before where someone has, has said to me, oh, they won't take an, uh, where I talk to them. And I go, hey, would you, would your client take an offer at this price? No. And we submit it. And guess what? We went into escrow. So, you know, it, it's not for us as agents to really decide on this one. It's here's the offer. Here's the term. The biggest thing is now we're including the offer of compensation in the RPA, if that's what they want to do. Okay. Or they're paying us one of the two. Okay. That so makes that's, a lot of sense. All it really comes down to. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. So Crystal. I just have a quick question and I mm-hmm. feel like I know the answer, but I just want to run it by you. So when a buyer marks that they don't have the financial means to pay for the compensation, you're still putting your two and a half percent in the beginning of that buyer broker agreement or it's either or. Well, no, no, no. It's whatever. Well, you have to put the amount in there. Okay. okay that's now, fine. is that two and a half percent? Is that 3%? Is that 1%? Okay. It's whatever you guys agree to. Okay. okay. What exactly. you're really doing when they say they don't have the means to pay you is making it to where now it's every offer that you present is going to include that, which means they might get a lot of rejections. They yeah. might get no rejections. You okay. see what I mean? Yes. But it's, and it's also the fact that as far as I'm concerned, we have knowledge of it. So is that something that that you're willing to do. I mean, the bottom line is your that's now affecting your income as well. So it's it's a two sided thing. Now, it just means just like uh, like here in San Diego, we used to deal a lot with we do a lot of VA, and sometimes our clients only have enough or don't have their down payment. They have enough for the EMD, so we know that the properties they're presenting on, they're going to be asking for credit for closing costs. Same concept. We have a team member right now who's in this exact situation. I don't know if she's on the call. Um, mm-hmm. But she basically wrote an offer for a property and they countered um, and she had the SPVB and they countered it at 1% commission. Um, and her agreement with the buyer was more than that. Mm-hmm. But, um, they don't have the financial means. So, and it's a multiple counter situation. So this yeah. is a life practice. And, and we're going to see a lot of that now too. I mean, again, that's why I like the, the example of the VA. I mean, and if you want, we can talk to her, I can call her offline or whatever, and we'll go over it. But that's, you know, we're going to see more of this. And again, it's the option is with you, you know, as the agent, can I reduce my commission? I can. Can I say, nope, not going to do it. And she's got to find another property. Yes, you can. That is your choice. You know, as an agent and a brokerage, that's, that's where we're at now. But that's what really it comes down to is that we have knowledge of it and, you have to decide, okay, are we going to allow this or, or are we going to do this? Or are we going to say we have to find another property? So, okay. And, and now is a good time to talk to that lender. Crystal, I'm going to send you a private message. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Todd. Hi, thanks. So I recently had a transaction with an unrepresented party and I discovered there was, well, I already know, but there was a lot of um, possibilities of liability in there. So my question is, when representing a seller, if they receive an offer from an unrepresented party and they uh, submit their offer, can we counter that and say that we would work with them if they're represented? No. No. Okay. So you can just decline the offer. I'm almost positive that because you can't force representation on somebody. You can, you can counter the terms, but one of them is, it's like me saying, you know, it's like, um, I don't have a good analogy for it, but I can't tell someone they have to use an agent. You know what I mean? Because what I can do is say, you know, hey, I don't like the terms of your offer and here it is. But it's, it's the, the term should be, I don't like price, I don't like this, I don't like that. And then, I mean, that's, but I mean, can the seller use that as consideration? In my opinion, yeah, they can. Um, because of the fact there could be possible liability. There could be all sorts of things that result from it. I think we go down a, a slippery slope on this one, but to answer your question, no, they can't. My understanding is you cannot counter saying you have to have representation. They choose to buy a property without an agent. That's their risk. They just leave themselves open to certain liabilities, I believe. And if they're not using the car forms, I mean, that's that's up to them too. That's still an offer to, to property. I, what I would do if I'm the listing agent... And I received, so we see this every now and then you'll see offers that come in that aren't on car forms. And I will then immediately notify the broker. That's my advice. Because there are certain protections that don't become afforded by not using, that we're not aware of by not using the car form. So that's my bigger concern with that. So that's one where you get your broker involved right before it's accepted. 
send them a text with a little 911. Say, so say that unrepresented person comes in with a much higher offer and your client really wants to go with it and it's not using car forms and all that, I would contact the, your broker and just put it on their radar. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Good question though. Lydia? I realize I'm slouching. All right. I want to play devil's advocate here for a minute and follow up on what Crystal had just talked about. So, because I've kind of been faced with this and, and I literally lost uh, mm -hmm. a client because of what was going on. Um, so you've got a buyer that basically says, we don't have the funds to pay. All mm -hmm. right. You're telling me from what I understand is that I can call the selling agent and say, is your seller willing to pay compensation? Question. Mm -hmm. uh, I get a yes or a no. If they are not willing to pay compensation, technically, am I obligated since my buyer says we can't pay it? Am I required to show them that home, even though I have been told by the selling agent, they're not going to pay any compensation? Let me change it. Okay. Let me change that from compensation to is your seller willing to pay closing costs? Okay. Okay. And if they said no, really, even if the offer was X amount. Okay. You see what I mean? This is so where I get a little, because again, it depends on the offer. Be. Right. It depends on the offer. And that's where I have a hard time answering that. You know what I mean? Because it's like, it really depends on the offer as this totality. And that's where we don't want to go down the slope. Like, you know, people will say, oh, well, I don't want to, but they're not going to pay any compensation. Well, but our offer is going to be dependent on certain things. And it's not, it, it's, it's a tricky situation. So that's right. where I, I have a hard time saying that one. Right. But you, you, you've, you're making that call first before you're even going out to show houses. Well, no, what we're doing is we're asking the buyer if they have the means to do it, just like we are in a right. lot of other situations. Right. And they say no. Correct. And so and then, before, before we go show homes, I'm making phone calls to find out if compensation is included. Mm -hmm. of, and, of what you would, and what you would do, here's where I would do, and I'll, I will ask, you know, another opinion on this one. I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'm sure, I, did Karen disappear? I was going to ask, because I like getting the secondary on this one too. Um, here's how I would honestly approach that. I would tell the client that they've said they're not paying any additional compensation. If it really came down to it, I would, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I would still show the home and I would still present an offer on it. If it, if it came down to it, and I've done that with VA and that's why I brought that up right. and have gotten those offers accepted. You know, even when they say we're not going to do it because they've seen, because my explanation was we're going to have to do this with our offer price to probably get that financed. It's another term, just like anything else. That's how okay. I, and this is just my personal opinion. Okay. Um, and I say that because I don't want to, anyone to say, oh, Mike Shapin said this and this thing, and that's legal. I'm like, no, personal, because there's an element of our business that's not just, it's not just what the regulations, how do we get this through and how do we negotiate this in? You know what I mean? And if that's obviously an important term, it's got to be done. And to me, I just had to shift my mindset. It's not what I'm getting paid. It's just the normal cost of them trying to buy a home. And I'm trying to work right. that out. See? Right. So that's one. Am I taking, are we taking a risk on that? Of course we are. And I would let the client know, just like any disclosure, I did ask them if they're willing to pay buyer compensation. And the answer was no. Would you still like to see it and see if maybe we can incorporate in the offer and get the answer for and get it done? Yeah. The thing is, the one who's taking the risk there, honestly, is us. Are you willing to take that risk? That's why I'm asking. But that's why. You know, so I mean, it's it's hard because now we start getting into are we this is where I have a problem with some of this. This is just me talking. We're fiduciaries. We do things for the client. At the same time, there's code of ethics things that say we're not supposed to incorporate commission. But now we're being forced to. Yeah. So and, at the same and are time, we steering or not steering people it, to a home that they can afford, not necessarily steering in, in the, well, the essence of the way it's described. But are we steering them to homes that will compensate us? To well, be able it's to do our job. It's technically not a home they can afford because they can't pay the closing costs. Exactly. That they've okay. You see what I mean? And that's, that's what I'm saying. We're in this weird nexus right now. We're trying to get used to it. So honestly, right now, I would still show the home and put the offer in. That's just me because I would want to say face to my client. And I would want to say face here and say, hey, this is what we did. They have a buyer representation agreement that says that's what's on there. And it, we try it and they say no. That's another term just like anything else in the offer. All right. Okay. And I know it's... 
I know it sucks to say it that way, but I'm also a practicing agent too, you know? So it's like, that's how, that's how I would approach that one. But no. what I, what I wouldn't do is say, is call them and say, I have a 2% commission when they pay that. You see what I mean? Okay. Yeah. I, I think understood we have to be very that. careful how we phrase right. that. Yeah. Okay. I understood that, that, that okay. will all come in on, on the last page. Okay. That Perfect. was a great exchange, Mike. I hundred percent support your, your position on that one. That, but that was a great question. Though. Thank you. So no, and I appreciate you asking that because I know a lot of people have yeah. that. It's a tricky one. And guess what? There is no like 100% right answer when we're dealing with this, but there's maybe a best way to approach it that might save face with the client, protect our interests, which is okay to do, you know, but at the same time, make sure we're being fair and equal and we're not violating anything. And that's, I think that the part we got to kind of tiptoe. So uh, Brad, do you still have a question or do you just leave the hand up? No, I still have a question. Thanks okay. for taking that. Since, well, do you mind? Oh, okay. So, Brad. Um, yeah. So, in this week, kind of the same topic we're on right now, but let's say that you have a client, brand new client, they're a buyer, you're re reviewing them with them, the BRBC agreement in the compensation question. They do come up to you and say, I don't have the twenty-five or $30,000 to pay for your side of their commission based upon the sales price I'm in. Mm -hmm. Um. I just want to hear what your response to them would be like. So if I was your client, I said, look, I don't have the money. How would you respond? Well, I'm debating how to, I know how I want to answer. I'm debating how to <laughs> phrase it correctly without, you know, because I've sat in on a few and I had one that was very, very good that said our confidence is our key. You know, personal information about me. So I have, I have, well, like many of us, I have medical stuff that I have to deal with just like anyone as we, as we age. And there's one doctor I might have to go to one time, depending if I ever need something. And I'll tell you right now, he's one of the best doctors here in San Diego, here in the, in the country and in the world. He's here in San Diego. And guess what? When he told me how much the service was going to be with my insurance, I didn't even question it because I'm like, I'm going to figure it out. So the reality was that we have confidence levels of this is my fee. Now, my answer is I can't, I can't pay that fee. Well, you, Brad, you have two options or three options. You can either say, well, this is, this is the fee we're at. Then maybe this isn't the greatest fit or two. Um, I'm willing to negotiate it or three, we're going to have to incorporate it in every offer. And that's it. You know, and I've, I've actually, that's how I would look. Cause it, it's hard. You know, you don't know. And just like the one before it's, we have, now we have choices of how we're going to do this. If you had a client come up to you and say, I have no money to pay into my closing costs, how would you approach that? Right. You know, you would say, I, well, I'm going to have to, I have the choice now if I'm going to work with this client, one, you know, and two, we're going to start having to disclose that inside of our offer and just know by prepping them, we may get more rejections on our offers. But I'm also, one thing I'm not going to tell you guys to do is to automatically drop your fee or tell the client you're not going to work with them. That's not my place to say it. That's not anyone's place to say. That's your your place. You so know? let me ask you to take so, over. And, and I hate to say, say it that way, but that's, you know, I will say though, I've had clients notwithstanding this who have asked me, you know, well, I, I, I'll I only work with you if you give me 20% of your commission. And I've said, thank you and have a nice day. So in I this- have. I've said, yeah. I, I, I personally have a problem with that. I offer if you get my commission, not the other way around. You know, but that's how I get paid to do my work and put the effort in that I'm doing. So unfortunately, that's that's kind of the best answer I can give you with that. I've so, seen so people because it also depends on how you're weighing out the client and what you think an adequate response would be based on that interaction. I think this is one that doesn't have a good script. Right. No, Brad, and and I know Brad, and Brad, you know, you, you know, if you were sitting in front of me, I would say you have to decide whether or not you are a for-profit or non-profit organization. <laughs> I think that's the big one too. I mean, there, there's a certain level where it's like, you know, I mean, here's the thing: I've taken clients. The reason I say that I've discounted clients before. I discounted one client specifically because I knew there were four other clients that were probably going to come over by me doing good by them. You know, and I've done that. I've, I've weighed it out, but I also did it in a very specific fashion. I charge what I charge based on certain criteria. Um, you know, and maybe I think, okay, this will work out and not, but that's my choice to do. And it's not because of any discriminatory or anything like that. It's me looking, okay, here's my income. Here's the investment I'm going to do into them. Same thing like my listings. I invest so I can market the home for this long. And in that time, 
If the home sells, cool. If it doesn't, well, that was my risk. And hopefully I can re-sign that listing agreement, right? Well, here with the buyer's side, it's, well, this is what we're doing. And, you know, if they don't have the means to do it, I have to make a choice. They have to make a choice. If you're at 30,000, well, you're up at over a million, which is our median. You know, you're really saying, is this going to work? So it's a two-sided agreement. It's just like not fixed by law and fully negotiable. So just a couple of questions here. Brad, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. I think the challenge, the next thought I had on this, and I know I'm going down a rabbit hole, but it's like if I'm the prospective buyer, then I feel kind of forced into having to work with someone who I'm going to be able to pay a fee I can't afford. So therefore, I'm going to maybe come back to you and say, well, fine, I want to buy this house. I believe the seller would accept my offer if I didn't have a fee. And now you're telling me I can't make an offer on that property because you showed it to me. And I'm not saying that's, you know, I just see potential for more cases down the well, road. Well, I will back up on that. One, they didn't see that property with you without having a written agreement, which means you guys have already had this discussion about the cost. Right. That's part one. So that, that scenario shouldn't happen. I'm sure it will, but I'm just saying, if done correctly, it shouldn't happen. That's why we're trying to train everyone to do it correctly. Because you should be having these discussions before you've gone out there and shown them anything. So right. that you're aware and they're aware. That's part one. Um, and then part two, if they want to make an offer on a property without you, they're willing and able to do that. You know, they, but they're also taking risks themselves. And, and that means that they're not going to be introduced to that property by you, which means you're going to have your time to find a buyer who is willing to pay the fee to you and not waste your time. Right. I get that's it. And I hate to say it that way, that, but that's why I wish I could, every time I get this, I wish I could give you a specific answer and it, no one can. It's going to be dependent on those circumstances at the time. It's kind of like when someone, like the argument, when someone comes to me and says, oh, the attorneys told me this. And I go, well, but at the same time, what was the fact pattern that happened with that? You know what I mean? And so on that it, note, it's... Mike, I just want to check in with Allie on sure. timing. Allie, um, how are I, we doing? We're, we're past one, but if everyone wants to stay, this is great value if Mike still has the time. Um, I, have, I have time. I'm good. So, okay, good. So I, I just want to bring up one question. As long as I, need on to, that I think I have a hard stop at last. You have, you have a hard time when? <laughs> Guess he's at I guess a hard stop. I have a hard stop. He froze. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, Mike. Okay. Thanks, Jess. You, you got it, honey. Hey, Shapar, go ahead with your question. Okay. Um. Uh, hi. My question is, yeah. so, uh, do, uh, do I have to have a blank um, a buyer broker form to give to any visitor who comes to my uh, open house and gets interested to buy or to just be their representative? Do I have to have forms to give to people when they want? Well, not? you know, Karen, while on that note, while he's chiming back in again, hey, Karen, you know, yes. we had somebody bring up another good point relative to giving out forms, but but can you speak to the open house form? And then, and then if you have to give the non- exclusive form right the mba was it the mba okay so uh, well wait but if we give them a form but and we say we can't help them with that form is there a liability associated with us giving them a blank form that says they're on their own okay so the form that everybody's going to use is the ona c it's the open house non-agency disclosure and sign in and you can see that there are places to be signed by the buyers that come in. Okay. Now, the thing to remember is that when you're holding an open house, you represent the seller. Yes. So That's true. You're, you don't need them to sign anything because you're not representing them. And the whole point about buyer representation is whoever is representing the buyer is the one who has to have an agency agreement of some form signed before they show property but you yes, was my, agent, my question is that if a buyer comes and he said no i don't have any agent would you agree to be my agent then you would want to do a um you could do the psra which is for um p potential just a few properties three properties and it is right here it's the property showing up up and, up, up up higher Higher. There you go. <laughs> okay. Come back, Mike. Okay. No, I'm back. I know. Of course I am, right? Well, that's why I kind of like it because my internet stinks right now, apparently. So. so this is what they would use if they wanted, if they didn't have a buyer's agent and they wanted you to be their buyer's agent and your broker is agreeable, 
you could either use the buyer representation or you could use this form. This okay, is so in either or. Yeah, it's a short form version of it. Right. So okay. and that's, that's what bring good it. for 30 days. Correct. And there's there's a few and it, we chose not to go over a lot of them just for this reason just because we didn't want to confuse but no that's a good form and we'll probably have there'll be some follow-ups on it but just like karen said like your your whole thing is that you you make the negotiation and agreement with them right there and there's also going to be in fact i'm not mistaken karen the open house uh sign-ins also have there's gonna be an open house one that's specific to that too we so that yeah. when when you were in the nether zone <laughs> oh when i was in the netherland okay good there we go. Yeah, the ONA C. Okay. It's called the ONA C. The ONA C. So there are so yeah. many. I mean, here's Chicago. the thing, Shmer. If you can get a BRBC sign, then yeah, do that. It's going to have the most protections in there and everything that's that's there. But okay. sometimes you have to work with the client. But so what you don't it, do it is- It would be better to take a, a couple of uh, BRBC form, blank form. Yeah. Because I had, I had people who came to my open house and they said, yeah. oh, we don't have uh, any agent. Can you represent us? You know? Yes. So- that's said, terrible okay, when that I, happens, but that's see, lovely. Let me see if I can do that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Horrible, horrible when that happens. Horrible. Right? But here, here's my here's my card, and here's how we rock and roll. So yeah, I mean, just you know, I think that's great, and that's that's how it should be in there. So, but yeah, the the thing is, again, just to reiterate, you cannot do anything without a written agreement. I mean, I've made this joke and other stuff. You have you need a written agreement to test drive a Kia for for twenty minutes. So <laughs> I, it's like. So this shouldn't be like be be hard for a lot of us to to really get behind, but yeah. And there's short okay. form versions. All good, Shapar. All good. Thank you. Okay, Thank you're welcome. Liz, go ahead, unmute. There you go. Yeah, I'm just curious if anybody is um, has heard anything or has any suspicions or concerns um, as it relates to the DOJ or the Attorney General uh, in particular getting involved. CAR revised the forms in May, to my understanding, and then when the Attorney General or Department of Justice chimed in, they revised them again for the more recent forms that we have mm -hmm. from July. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is, is there any suspicion or concern that now the DOJ or the Attorney General is going to collaborate with the DRE to sort of uh, investigate us or look for issues or problems with all these changes. Is that, so, I mean, we have enough rules as it is, but. Well, here's here's where I'll interject on this. Um, that's a good question because I know a lot of people have it. And here's how I look at it. One, when the forms changed, it was because the CARS forms committee and they all met specifically going, okay, there's concerns here. And ultimately, how do we make this the best moving forward to try and, because DOJ is still trying on stuff, right? And the bottom line is, I, I can only speak to how I personally look at it. This is our final version. This is where we're at right now. Could there be changes down the road? Yes. We'll do what we always do. We adapt to it. What I can say is I highly encourage people, this is where I get my plug for stuff, to get involved in things like your associations, RPAC, and those committees and do things because that does actually work. We've done that work in the past. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, where it's set now, you know, there were concerns from DOJ, but the forms committees for CAR actually met specifically and said, how do we change this now so that we have the least amount of headache? Because doing these changes is a headache. You see all the trainings, all the things we need to do, and how can we make this work, right? So that's one thing. And I will say Karen's on a uh, forms committee for CAR, correct? No? No. Okay, we just I'm know Nikki and all that. I'm yeah. waiting oh, okay. to hear. But I oh, sit on just others. Here. But Mike, I wanted to share something else from the CAR attorney this morning is one yeah. that when it comes to the BFPI and the BIPP, they're going to be watching for fair housing standards, <laughs> meaning whatever you do for one person, do it for everyone. Do not ever make an exception. No. So that could be viewed as discriminatory. And the DOJ is going to be watching agents to see who is violating antitrust law. Yeah, so be, they are going to be keeping an eye on us to make sure that we're following what we have to follow and not getting clever. I mean, I've heard of people wanting to use decimal, decimal points on the MLS. 
Oh, uh, I've seen a lot of joke memes on this one of how the words all come together with 3%. Yeah, but yeah. Do yourselves a favor though, by the way, if you see a Facebook group, which I can just, I can just, I can just predict, uh, there'll be a Facebook group saying uh, properties paying broker compensation 3%. Do not join it if you see it. No, I'm not saying it's there, Tessa. I'm saying it's going to be there. Like, do people realize that we have clear cooperation and clear cooperation says you are not to advertise a home unless it's an office exclusive uh, without it being on the MLS. And if I go onto Facebook right now, I can see San Diego off market properties right there. So, and that's, you guys don't realize that's the low hanging fruit of the DRE. They love it. They just go online and literally click stuff and go, okay, violation, violation, but I mean, this is, and it's monitored by our, by, by local associations too. So I can just see it. Look, we don't know what the future is going to bring. And I think it's a really good question. As far as what DOJ wants, I know that they want more and whether or not that'll happen, we don't know, but I try to go, this is what we have right now. And there were changes that were made and those changes have now been incorporated and we're, we're pivoting and we're going to move forward with them. And as it comes forward, we're going to do more, but I can't say enough as the former chair of the political action committee here in San Diego and former member of like things like GA and all that government affairs, um, be involved in that stuff. Cause believe it or not, it, it does make a difference. So that that's my side pitch for that. But I, I wish I could give you a better a better um, understanding Thanks. on that one. Thanks, okay. Mike. Liz, all good? All good there? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. All right, Crystal's got some good ones. When she unmutes, oh, there you go. Here we are. <laughs> I, every time that happens, I think I froze. I know. Okay, so just a quick question on the flip side of this, moving forward a few months, and we're running comps as a listing agent. Mm -hmm. And we're looking, you know, because in the past, the comps included commission obviously for a listing side and buy side in that in number so with comps moving forward is it going to show up as a closing cost credit or concessions that buyer side commission or are we calling these agents afterwards and asking if they if there was any uh, concessions towards the buyer broker Mine, I'm gonna let Karen because she's on MLS and she can speak for SDMLS, but we we can't speak for CRMLS right now. Okay. So I but I'm pretty sure we're gonna include too. that in commission, right? We're we're so gonna show as it of, as of this morning, CRMLS is gonna break it all down. Yeah. So on CRMLS, you will see what the compensation is after the close of escrow. SDMLS at this point in time hasn't released what theirs are going to be, but here's two dates you all should know, which everyone's just learning this week. SDMLS will be instituting this on August 12th. So as of August 12th, there will be no CBB field and there will be no compensation field. I'm actually going to put something in the chat for all of you. If you don't have it, it was the policy change effective that was sent out on August 2nd. So just the other day that has all these key changes and dates as it pertains to SDMLS. Okay. okay. RMLS so. is going to change theirs on August 13th. So I'll put that in here right here. Thank you, Mike. And then you guys have that. And that also from, oh, wait, I put, I sent that directly to Karen. Let me do this. Hold on. Crystal, um, did, that, did that address it? Um, I guess I'm still curious after closing and we're looking at these properties that closed escrow, will we be able to decipher um, if there was a commission that was shared with the buyer broker as part uh, of it? Well, we don't want to say commission share anymore. So there's no longer a commission share, but was there a commission that was paid from the seller as a concession? The answer is yes. Okay. Because that does that does affect like wondering, okay, well, what was the total price on the property? Okay. So post-close, yes. Pre-close, okay. no. Okay. Um, or pre-offer. Does that help? Yep. Good. Okay. Thank Linda. You. Part one. Linda, go ahead and unmute yourself. And um, thanks. Um, yeah, just wanted to ask you if we have in the buyer's representation agreement a set commission that's just say two and a half percent, and in the offer the seller just agrees to the one percent, and we know that the buyer can't pay the additional one and a half percent, and we are going to relieve them of that obligation. Is there a formal way in which we need to do it, or is it just between the buyer and ourselves that we just say you don't have to pay the rest? Well, oh. I'm, I'm confused. Can you say that one more time? Because I think I missed the first part as I was putting this in. You're saying that they've agreed. And I think I lost it right when you said release them of their obligations. If you wouldn't mind repeating that question one more time. 
Yes, just that we've, we've got an agreement for 2.5% with the buyer. The seller only agrees to pay 1%. We know that the seller, the buyer, cannot pay any more or is not willing to really, you know, wants to renege a little bit on that agreement. And we're okay because we're going to just take the 1%. Is there a formal uh, um, signing that we need to do with the buyer to release them from that obligation? Yes, we do a modification, uh, the modification of terms form. You would you would modify your, your BRBC agreement. So there is a the modification form and you would, I would officially modify it to say that. So, and basically what you would do is simply say that you're reducing that buyer, that buyer compensation. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot. And then just one quick other question, that form that you were bringing up with the open house, is that additional way of selling, of showing the property with possible representation? Is that something that only applies to when we have open houses or can we use that in a shortened for, for, form if we're rushing out to show a buyer a property and we don't have time to go through the full buyer representation agreement, can we use that as an interim form yes, for showing yes. that property? That was That's what it's designed for. Okay. So it's meant, my opinion, and I remember, we also don't realize, so Karen and I sat when I was over at SDMLS and we were, we were sitting back and like, we literally spent, I think we spent two days inside the main classroom with the big whiteboard. I took a picture of it. It was like when I was doing my grad school and all that stuff where I have this big thing all drafted up. But that's the whole thing. It's trying to understand what's the best use for each form. And there is, I swear, I swear my darn, there is a logic. Um, and one of the logics there is, okay, I'm at an open house. Do I have time to go over the entire BRBC? Can I do a short form so that I'm protected, they're protected, everything's good. And that's where that comes into play. That's at least how we kind of looked at it. Uh, same thing with the open house logic. I got someone who just wants to come in and take a look at it. Fine. Sign in here and you recognize that I'm now doing blah, 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 blah. So they're meant to go in stages. So say the way I looked at it was, say I got a, a lead off Zillow or something, right? Or realtor.com or one of my sources or something where like, come meet me at this house. Okay. I show up and I go look and I tell them I can't show it without having some form signed. And I hate to say it kind of like using the, uh, the, I want to test drive a Kia example. Here's some forms we need to go over real quick. And this is one of them. Okay. So it gives you kind of a limited version of it to where they're not so intimidated by it. That's one thing. That's one way I like to look at it, knowing that you're going to eventually do something that's a little more. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Perfect. And then Karen, is, you're the last hand up. No, sorry. I didn't put it down. <laughs> All right. Tessa, you're muted. Tessa, you're muted. Um, hey, Tyler, are you still on board with us, Tyler? Tyler had a good question. Tyler, are you there? So yes, I am. Can okay, you hear me? Great. Ask your question. Sorry about that, Tyler. No, you guys are good. Um, my question was, what stops the buyer with a non-exclusive or exclusive agreement from ghosting you and buying a property with another agent? Let's say you've showed them properties, you could have maybe written offers, and then all of a sudden you don't hear from them again. Um, like, should you be watching the properties, you know, that you showed them? Or, I mean, what would you do in that case? No, well, here's the thing. And that's, that's, that's hard too. And I've, I've actually had that. Um, you know, I, that's why I always love trying to, I, I put humor into things one, because it keeps people attention, but because two, it also gives us like, well, how would you approach it? How would you approach it? If I always say like, if we're dating, how do we, how do we handle if we got ghosted and everybody's been ghosted? Um, it's not just me, but I'm just saying, uh, if something happens where the client's not responding to you and you get to a certain level, you need to send over the NDIP and say, look, I haven't heard from you. Here's the notice of the properties that I have shown you and i'm hoping that you get back to me but in case you are looking at properties with somebody else just know these are excluded from that and then you know you would just go from there but that's that's the biggest thing that's just on the on the ones that you have under a non-exclusive agreement but uh, i mean so te technically the same thing could happen with an exclusive agreement correct uh with an exclude well but the difference is when the exclusive they buy a property you get paid with a non-exclusive it's only subject to the ones that you have shown them or had broker involvement in that's why we define broker involvement you see what i mean okay, so gotcha. with the exclusive if we go past them if they haven't given you written notice and you get to the 90 day point then send them the notice of broker involved properties if you have a clause that says past the expiration of the contract you see what i mean it's a, it's a weird tier level you got to kind of look at there's a lot of ifs in there but when you're looking at like non-exclusive, if they ghosted you, like maybe you haven't heard back from in a week or whatever you think, send them over the notice of broker involved properties. Send it after two days of not talking to them. 
Um, I see your hand, Karen. Send it after two days of not talking to him if you think, but just say, hey, I haven't heard back from you, but I just want to, I'm not sure. Here's just as an update. These are the properties that we did look at together. You see what I mean? Then you've got yourself covered to where you've given them notice and you're not really like saying, oh, you're cheating on me. What's going on? So Karen? So um, it's important that you remember, um, and I figured out a way to remember it. So you have to submit that notice of broker involved properties prior to the expiration. So and how you remember it is prior to expire. <laughs> if you can remember, you know, that's how I remember it. If there's a cancellation of your broker representation agreement, you have five days to get it. But you must have something showing the properties that you've shown. So we don't have the ABCD anymore to use for that purpose. So take your tear sheets, your MLS tear sheets, and have them initial it, which it'll have the date on it that you know put the date on it that you showed it because you want to have proof that you showed those properties um to that client by the way and if they don't if they ghost you for a matter of days i would send it immediately send it, send it. yeah and that's the whole thing i mean it's it's your best effort in your call you know whether or not i mean i just had it happen the other day i thought someone was 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 good and then all of a sudden they were like oh no no we found a property place now we got accepted i had a non-exclusive with them and i was like oh well that sucks you could let me know but I mean, it happens. So they show up at open houses, they do things, whichever it is. So you just want to let them know. Um, it's hard sometimes to monitor it. It is, you know, I mean, and my best, and here's the other thing, my best advice to you, say I have a non-exclusive agreement and I sent over the notice of broker involved properties and say somehow like I found out once because an escrow officer let us know. And um just because she knew it was the buyer we were working with and all that. We found out it was a property that we had covered by the MBIP. Um, don't call them. Don't go, oh, gotcha. Call your broker. Send it to them and let them handle it broker to broker. That's my best advice on that. Okay? Because the broker is the one who's ultimately going to bring the suit. And you don't want to be the one who's calling and yelling at a buyer and all that. The suit's going to be between the brokers. And how, and then let that broker be the bad guy to that client and say, wait, you had an agreement with, you know, Mike over here. Why didn't you tell us that in the forums? You know, and that's, that way you're not the jerk. You know what I mean? You're saving face and you're just letting the brokers handle it. That's what we're there for. So, but that's, it's, it's hard. Sometimes you make the decision to let it go. Sometimes you don't, it's, it's, it's fully up to you and your broker. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, then, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. I was, I was kind of wondering that same thing with how the listing agent would be involved in that. So if you were showing Tyler a property that Karen had listed and Karen knows you showed it because it was in showing time, I, I'm just, it, it, sometimes is there some informal communication that goes on that Karen can say, well, wait a minute, didn't, didn't Mike show you that property? They're supposed to be. And that's why, again, you monitor it, but that's also why I said you don't want to be the agent that's sending over. You don't don't go confront the buyer. Let the broker do it. Let the broker handle it with the other broker, and they'll trust me. They will. <laughs> so you know, and, and that's that's the whole thing. You you just don't that, but that's yeah. They they should, but that's the whole reason that we keep this. And uh, sometimes, and look, sometimes you're gonna have. I'm, I wish I could tell you that it doesn't happen. I wish I could tell you that you're gonna have a buyer that's in a non-exclusive agreement. Um, or even an exclusive agreement that goes and buys a property and you never find out about it and it sucks, you know, when it happens. I wish I could tell you that doesn't happen. It does, you know, and when people do that, they take risks. They, they goes, take chance being liable for stuff themselves. So that goes right into your point. If you're doing a non-exclusive agreement with, with buyer Tessa and you ask to see, I want to see everything you've signed with your other agents because- sure then you would know being the new agent representing that buyer, if that buyer's actually seen that property before Correct. or not. Correct. So, I mean, there's a lot and that, that's the thing. I know I'm a little more, I, I want everyone to run their business how they want to run it, but we definitely give them the advised ways to do these things. So. And then recommended. last and final question, Mike, that I, that I can see so far is how are we handling buyer compensation with BAs? We didn't really touch that today. Uh, no, it's, it's an allowable fee. So allowable yeah, fee. that's right now it's an allowable fee. So as far as I'm concerned, it's the same as anything else. We're asking, you are either asking for a credit or we're including it, but it is now a buyer, at least temporarily, it is a buyer allowable fee. And I only say that because they didn't change the official. They said, okay, we're issuing where we're allowing this and we're expecting it to be a permanent change. 
So that's all. But yeah, it's, it's so just in, like any other cost. So in closing, thank you, Mike. Um, big thank you to Allie for knowing and keeping her finger on the pulse of what our agents need in the community and bringing Mike to the forefront to be able to deliver to you guys the valuable information that you need. We're, we're over time by 30 minutes. And I apologize for that. But Allie, you want to take it from here? Allie, thank you so much for bringing this to all of us. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. A big special thank you to Mike for your time and preparing and uh, providing this training. Thank you, Karen, for jumping in with some uh, added support to the questions that Mike brought up to everybody. Uh, there will be a recording of this. I will have it up on my YouTube channel by tomorrow. Everybody who attended, everybody who registered, and everybody in my database will receive a link to this. Um, feel free to share this with other agents in your brokerage. This is some really good valuable information. And that's why we're all here to share this information and adjust to these changes as best we can together. Perfect. Well, thank, so thank you. you, everybody. Thank you, ladies, for letting us begin here. Okay, <laughs> that's it. No one else is chiming in. You guys go rock it. Have a great week. Bye now. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.